Mr. Chief Speaker. As we resume, member for Princess Town, you have your initial 22 minutes, 45 seconds of your initial speaking time. And would you like your additional 10 minutes one time? Yes, sir. Okay, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I would like to look at the area of youth development and sport. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in this year's budget presentation, a major announcement in the area of sport was the establishment of the National Sport Commission. This entity will replace the sport company of Trinidad and Tobago. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, this National Sport Commission has really been placed in the public domain with more questions than answers. And I'm hoping, well, I had hoped that the Honorable Minister of Sport would have advanced some of the plans and policies that would be put in place with respect to the National Sport Commission. Mr. Deputy Speaker, while we were on break, I took the opportunity to look at what was happening in the arena of sports with respect to the news. And what is circulating right now on international news, ESPN and other uh, media platforms, is a visit by the US men's team for the World Cup qualifier taking place in Trinidad and Tobago for the 2018 Olympic, um, World, Cup. World Cup Games, sorry, not Olympics, right. World Cup Games. Mr. Deputy Speaker, that is currently taking place in the constituency of Coover South, I believe that match, um, the, the preparation is taking place in Coover South. Mr. Deputy Speaker, what is being put on the front pages and through the media is the headline not road to Russia, but river to Russia. In that there are so many problems that, are, that is plaguing that Atobolden Stadium, um, exacerbated by work that is currently being conducted in that area. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is another area of poor project management. And I'm really hoping that the Honorable Member for Diego Martin Central would take the opportunity to see what relief that he can provide in terms of relieving us of that international embarrassment that is currently taking place right now. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is my hope that the minister and the ministry, after two years of bacchanal, hysteria and romping, will settle down and get to work. I hope that the minister understands that just by changing a name, you know they say a rose by another name is just a rose. I hope the minister understands that changing the name will not just change the culture, of the sports industry in Trinidad and Tobago. The minister has indicated publicly that he is modeling the sport commission after both the UK and the Australia models, but he has fleshed out, he has failed to deal with fleshing out the target areas, specific public-private partnerships, which honorable minister is an area we want to hear a lot more of. Long-term plans for specific industries or areas of specialty improved athlete programs, legislation that is compatible with other countries we may partner with in respect to the athletes program, as well as a financial oversight for dispersing funds to groups, organizations, and individuals. Therefore, Mr. Deputy Speaker, again, there are more questions than answers. A very similar approach to what happened with the tourism development company. Mr. Deputy Speaker, there's no Surprise that one of the most contentious issues in the area of sport for the past few months has been undoubtedly the opening of the Brian Lara Stadium. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it has always been the view of the opposition that the stadium has significant question marks over its safety and priority, and members opposite try to give the impression that members on this side attended matches at that stadium. Nothing is further from the truth, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I will tell you why. Mr. Deputy Speaker, you see, we place priority on people-centered issues, and we will never put a stadium's completion over the opening of a children's hospital in this country. <clears throat> Mr. Deputy Speaker, having spent an additional $100 million 
almost $1.3 billion on the Brian Lara Stadium, which took 10 years under the People's National Movement to complete. I will pose several questions to the minister, which I hope he will be able to answer. Through you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. One, does the stadium finally have accreditation from the International Cricket Council? Two, seeing the minister's maths was that the opening ceremony brought in under 700,000 in revenue after three million was spent on the event. Is he satisfied still that a half empty stadium and $3 million down the drain was value for money. Three, why was the Brian Lara Stadium half empty on most nights of the matches except for the final of the recently concluded CPL? Four, what is the monthly operationalizing cost for the academy and stadium? Five, is the social media video that I believe is circulating as of this morning with players, dressing rooms being flooded out, etc., for the CPL final and having to utilize the corridors. Mr. Deputy Speaker, again, while we congratulate the TKR team, our government was people-centered and we focused on bettering the lives of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And that is why, again, I will repeat, we advanced issues like the Coover's Children's Hospital over the Brian Lara Stadium. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Ministry of Sport and Youth Affairs received an allocation of over $0.3 billion. And I was happy but surprised that the Minister of Finance lauded the National Aquatic Center, the National Tennis Center, and the National Cycling Center. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we on this side take paternity of those projects because it was a leader, like Mrs. Kamla Pasabi says, a member for Superior, who endeavored to bring about real diversification thrusts in this country. Comparable to tourism, the recreation and leisure market is one of the largest and fastest growing sectors of the global economy. The size of the industry serves sporting activities listed under serious leisure fields. And I know that members opposite will enjoy this. They looked at areas like golf, tennis, and fishing. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the sports sectors have commercialized and carefully reformed over the past 30 years. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would like to quote from a report that was commissioned by South Africa when they looked at moving away from industrialization and using the medium of sports tourism to boost and enhance their economy. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is what that report had to say, and I quote, the restructuring of the sector has taken the objective of profit generation. The evolution of sport and its increasing role within the globalization process and in the regeneration of national, regional, and local identities in the post-colonial and global age. Sport has been used as an economic strategy, and it has been observed, for instance, in the British context that most of the cities following this strategy of using sport for economic regeneration have been industrial cities not normally known as major tourist destinations. There has been a growing skepticism over the extent to which hosting mega events potentially results in economic growth. This includes skepticism on the significant development impacts as, as compared to smaller events. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the report goes on to say, and I quote, sports and sporting events have become integral components of a global political economy. The use of a sport as an economic and social remedy of issues targeted by politics, such as poverty alleviation and job creation, require the careful development of skills and infrastructure in order to maintain competitiveness internationally. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am here today about advancing ideas, policies, and solutions like many of my colleagues on this side because we want to see Trinidad and Tobago do better. And therefore, as a member of this house, I take serious issue with members coming from the government with policy plans and ideas but not being able to provide us with any real tangible solutions in terms of how it is going to be operationalized and worked out. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the report went on to say, in the United States, for instance, event sport tourism generated an estimate, estimated 27 billion a year. And this could be found in the Travel Industry Association of America annual reports, where more than 75 million American adults reported attending a sport event, either as a spectator or as a participant. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, the report goes on further 
where it identifies sport tourism as such a major any, uh, revenue generating stream that what you are seeing happening is that there is a, a psychology behind it. And the psychology behind it really is that those who participate in sport tourism really come from the middle class and upper middle class sectors that are able to spend more in that particular industry, therefore, therefore injecting the much needed funds. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to turn to the area of value for money with respect to the Ministry of Sport and Youth Affairs. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, you will recall there was an issue on the front pages of this country most recently about a $92,000 trip to Tobago by the Minister of Finance and members of the Ministry. Minister of Sport, sorry, and members of the Ministry, including then Permanent Secretary in the Ministry, P.S. Barrow. Mr. Deputy Speaker, let us look at the area of value for money and how the Ministry of Sport and Youth Affairs have dealt with this issue. This issue. Mr. Deputy Speaker, appearing before the Joint Select Committee on Public Administration and Appropriations, P.S. Barrow, who was P.S. in that ministry at that time, who had been acting in the position since January 2017, said the cost of the trip really was um, paid for taxpayers, but it was value for money. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would like to quote from the Joint Select Committee Public Administration and Appropriations, Hansard. And this is what P.S. Barrow had to say, which was corroborated by the Minister of Sport and Youth Affairs. I quote, I do think that the persons who were required for the other meetings that they were necessary, mainly because I think the site visit, especially to the Dwight York Stadium, was extremely enlightening. The conditions there, I think, it is extremely appalling with regards to not being able to actually use that facility. And we do have a lot of events that are coming up at that particular facility. And I do think it was necessary for us to actually see what was happening at that facility. We got a lot of reports in front of us, and I think you don't get that kind of urgency that you would get if you actually go and see a location. She maintained that pictures and videos of the state of the stadium would not have given an accurate enough depiction of the existing problems at, this, at the facility. Barrow listed problems with the infrastructure at the stadium as she sought to solidify the necessity for the delegation's trip to Tobago, saying that it was totally unusable. <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Minister of Sport corroborated the story given by the Permanent Secretary when questioned by the media, indicating that on several occasions, including that one, the Minister was keenly interested in getting a first-hand view. Mr. Deputy Speaker, let us turn to page 160 of the Public Sector Investment Program. There's a list of stadiums to be upgraded for improvement in fiscal 2018. Mr. Deputy Speaker, no mention of the Dwight York Stadium. However, five other stadiums in Trinidad will be upgraded at a cost of $3 million. When divided, an average of $0.6 million will be spent on each. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is noteworthy that all stadiums were built in the same financial year with the same plans and specifications. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in Tobago, on page 161 of the Public Sector Investment Program, government will spend $14.7 million on the following. Shaw Park Sporting Complex, Canaan Bonacord Recreation Ground, Palatuvia Sporting Facility, and Richmond Ground Culture. Mr. Deputy Speaker, on an average, $3.6 million will be spent on each. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's only when you look at the recurrent expenditure, you see that a facility that was described as non-functional, unusable, and dilapidated could not be open to the public with an allocation for increases. And you know what, Mr. Deputy Speaker? In recurrent expenditure, when you look, if I were to borrow the persona of my colleague for Orupuch East, he would tell you when you look at what is being spent on the recurrent expenditure, it is paper clip and tea bag. Nothing of substance that will add to the value of the Dwight York Stadium in terms of the infrastructure, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, that is value for money, PM style. $92,000 down the drain, Mr. Deputy Speaker, came with a Nancy story for the media through the Permanent Secretary and the Minister, and there's nothing contained in the budget documents when you look at for the Dwight York Stadium, Mr. Deputy Speaker. 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, this Rowley-led PNM administration continues to miss the mark. You see, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is not about the cloth. It is about the table. The empty kitchen and dining tables in this country that cannot afford food due to high prices. You know, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I heard, I heard my colleague from Diego Martin Central gave one long list of all the medals that Trinidad and Tobago had won and attributed that to the work that he was doing. And as I sat there, I started receiving messages from athletes on my phone who indicated, would you please tell the Minister of Sport, do not call our names because he did not support us and this government did not support us when we were looking at venturing at representing Trinidad and Tobago internationally. Mr. Deputy Speaker, you see they continue to miss the mark by focusing on the wrong things. Instead of focusing on tablecloths, they could have saved this country three million dollars that they have identified for the Shagaramas Golf Course. I will ask you to invoke section 53, Mr. Deputy please. Invoke section 53, please. We have been disturbed here. I want to listen to the honorable yes. member from Princess Town. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, golf is a luxury sport. Three million dollars is being spent on the Shagaramas upgrade. Mr. Deputy Speaker, that $3 million could have sent 10 children to university for the three years for a degree program. It could have saved three children life-saving surgeries, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, who likes and wants to play golf? Charge them. Increase the fees. Let them pay for their luxuries. Tax golf, not hard-working people in this country who are looking to make ends meet. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Minister of Finance is on record, of, on, is on record sorry, as saying that we must all play our part and accept part of the burden. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the citizens of this country want to see the government lead by example. It cannot be that I am eating dashin and dal every day and they are jet setting around the world. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I recall under previous People's National Movement Administration, if you look at a Ministry of Finance circular between the period 2006-2007, a decision taken, taken by the then PNM cabinet, that circular allowed for permanent secretaries, directors, etc., and chairman of boards to travel first class. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the sitting Prime Minister chastised a former Prime Minister member for Separia for traveling too much. He said that she had hot foot. Mr. Deputy Speaker, when you look at the travel patterns of the member for Digo Martin West, do you know that in the first year he has traveled more than the member for Separia as Prime Minister? Mr. Deputy Speaker, at a meeting on Pigot Corner, the Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley, said that he traveled seven times in 25 months. Thank God for these publications that are gazetted when the Prime Minister travels. Um, member, you know, member. Remember the standing order as against with regards to this place? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. My colleague, unfortunately, Paul Spain, North St. Ant West is not here. He was so concerned about me reading. But I want to tell them, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I could deal with any one of them, yes. anytime, yes. any place, anywhere, on any topic. And I will expose, I will expose the hypocrisy and the double standards, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker. In 25 months, the Prime Minister has traveled 17 times. And these are the destinations. Malta, Grenada, Barbados, Miami, Belize, Washington, Cuba, Guyana, Jamaica, California, Venezuela, Houston, New York, Chile, Grenada, and Barbados, and the last one being California, USA. But this Prime Minister has a preoccupation for bedroom slippers, duster, and as Paro would say, man in the bedroom. Oh my God. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that is the kind of leadership that we have in this country. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am asking the Honorable Prime Minister whether or not you are willing to put your money where your mouth is. You know, there are countries like India and Malaysia, you complain all about this traveling. 
Are you willing to do like India and Malaysia and ground your ministers of government yes. and ensure that every permanent secretary, every minister, every chairman of boards stop traveling first class? That is value for money. If we must all feel the pinch of the burden. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, allow me to look at the youth and the way forward. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the opportunity to look at some issues facing the youth of our country. My colleagues will deal with the issue of gate, but I want to turn to the area of youth unemployment and sustainable job creation. Mr. Deputy Speaker, with now over 300 young doctors and thousands of young professionals on the breadline, many who are sending out resumes and are not even getting a phone call or a letter of acknowledgement, what is the government doing about creating jobs for our nation's youth? And I really want to congratulate the member for Separia for having the vision, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to speak about the digital age yes. and the fourth industrial revolution. You see, instead of, sh instead of the member coming to speak about motorcycles and playway and lotto, what did she come and she spoke about? She spoke about the digital age, about empowering our young people through areas like informatics and micro work platforms, Mr. Deputy Speaker. That is a leader with a vision. That is a leader who has plans for our country, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, there are several areas in which we can approach changing the paradigm. And the Minister of Finance, member for Digo Martin North, he spoke about changing the paradigm. Mr. Deputy Speaker, is the paradigm about our young people hustling maxi taxis? Is that the vision? Because that is what I heard as a young person. I've always meant him, I'm the youngest member of parliament in the 11th parliament. And I was really hoping that there would have been something of substance for the youth. And I'm happy today to be able to stand up in this parliament and be the voice for the young people and say that you have failed us when it comes to any sustainable, real, tangible, productive plans. And that I will not take riding a maxi taxi as a tout or as a driver as any sustainable way to put Trinidad and Tobago on a sustainable path of growth and development, especially in the times that we are in now, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Honorable Member for Separia spoke about informatics. Mr. Deputy Speaker, she's the, the Honorable Member that is, that is, she was responsible for the building of the Coover Children's Hospital. She ensured that we focused on healthcare. The Member for Separia focused on the area of healthcare with the Point 14 Hospital and their Remo Hospital. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if you look at the industry standards across the world, and we have an opportunity right here in Trinidad and Tobago, in that if we infuse information technology, which is known as informatics in healthcare, what it does is that it creates jobs, but it also what changes the entire paradigm of how we do things. And we are starting at a good point, Member for St. Joseph, with these new facilities that these informatics can now look at diagnosis. They can now look at medical reports. They can now enhance medical tourism. They can now look at 3D um, x-rays, et cetera, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, that is the way of the world. When the Honorable Member for Separia spoke about her vision for micro work platforms, it was that she understood that the, in, the fourth industrial revolution had to deal with the digital age. And that is why she focused so much by ensuring that every child coming out of the, the, the SEA got a laptop because that is where the future is, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, you know the member for Dego Martin North, he spoke about the business development incentive as though it was something new. Mr. Deputy Speaker, that industry has been existing in Trinidad and Tobago for a long while. Mr. Deputy Speaker, when you look at that industry, what has been hampering its progress and its growth is the lack of investment. And that is why we focus a lot of I on ICTs and broadband with Trinidad and Tobago during our five-year tenure, as well as putting in place infrastructure that deals with the area of information technology. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I recall a front page express where half of the cabinet is on a bus riding from San Fernando to Port of Spain, and that was their plan for information technology. The Honorable Member for Separia came in this parliament and she stood in defense of the young people and she spoke about micro work 
platforms where you can now look at the areas of finance, the areas of medicine, the areas in information technology, the areas of science. The member for Karani Central in his wisdom in assisting the partnership in putting forward its manifesto in 2015 spoke about research and development areas. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, you will see many of the Latin American countries, those are the areas that they are looking in because they understand that a lot of these international conglomerates and these transnational companies, they are putting a lot of focus on research and development. And he spoke about the research and development institutes that would what, what it would do, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that it would place the focus on getting the new areas of expertise looked at that will also open up new markets and also create new revenue generating streams for Trinidad and Tobago. The Honorable Member for Carney Central, and I'm sure he will flesh out this as a member for Separia spoke, as well. When we had the concept for the Chagaramas Peninsula, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that we understood that the nightlife in Trinidad and Tobago was an area in which we could, was an untapped resource. The member for Baratari San Juan always speaks about that. Those areas are untapped resources, and that is why we focused also in sport, tourism, leisure, and the creative arts. And you know, I really want to take the opportunity, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to thank members in the creative arts industry for the past two days who really know good things when they see it, like a tablecloth jacket. I really want to thank people like Peter Elias and several of the local designers who have offered their assistance in advancing the creative industries in this country. But you know, Mr. Deputy Speaker, when you look at the creative industry index, this government has paid the least amount of emphasis and focus in terms of financing, that you will be able to advance areas like fashion and film and so on, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And there's been absolutely little or absolutely no mention of these particular areas. And these are the areas that the member for Separia tried to advance, the micro-work platforms, the informatics, the innocentive, those particular areas that will change the face of finance, economy, science, and information technology in our country, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if you with your permission, I would like to look at the area of community development, culture, and the arts. <coughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, I was at pain to listen to the Minister, the Minister of Finance on this particular ministry and topic. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it was almost as if the Minister of Finance has conceded that the government has given up on this particular industry. Mr. Deputy Speaker, when I look at the budget documents of 2017-2018, it tells a very telling tale of no new plans, no new initiatives, and no new incentives. Mr. Deputy Speaker, when you look at the PSIP, the Public Sector Investment Program, on page 236, all you see is rehashed projects with no vision for them. What is even more curious, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that after spending an additional $2 million on Napa in 2017, the Ministry of Community Development, Culture and the Arts in the PSIP has budgeted an additional $2 million for 2018. And I heard the members for San Fernando West. Remember the display of your reading material. You're not quoting from sure. it. My apologies, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I heard the Honorable Member for San Fernando West in a previous debate. He chastised the member for Urupush East. And he said it's as though that they come here and they don't read their documents. Well, I am wondering whether or not the Minister, for saying, the minister of Community Development, Culture and the Arts has read her documents. You see, Mr. Deputy Speaker, when you look at page 236 of the Public Sector Investment Program, it would be as though it was so shocking to me, Mr. Deputy Speaker, especially at a time when our country is going through so much financial strife and people can't get food, when you, you can't put books in the book bags of children, etc. Et Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'll tell you what is contained on page 236 of the PSIP under Community Development, Culture and Arts. Two million dollars will be spent for what? The upgrade of a VIP kitchenette. That is the plans that they have for Community Development, Culture and Arts at Napa. Two million dollars to upgrade a VIP kitchenette, Mr. Deputy Speaker. That is the vision. That is the vision they have for the Ministry of Community Development, Culture and Arts. Mr. Deputy Speaker, who is going to Napa to use the VIP kitchenette? It is the big boys and the big girls enjoying the champagne and the caviar. It is not trickling down to the, the industry with respect to, the, with respect to community development, culture Silence. and the arts. Mr. Deputy Speaker, 
Mr. Deputy Speaker. Many, Mr. Deputy Speaker, while there has been a focus on the big boy syndrome of champagne and caviar, I ask, there is no mention of the carnival industry under the PSCIPD development program or even the recurrent expenditure. It's almost as though just as much as the carnival industry has given up on the Minister of Community Development that she too has given up on them after now she is now in arbitration. Mr. Deputy Speaker, there has been no mention of the Ram Leela Center. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the minister came to this parliament and she indicated that there will be a policy with respect to funding and that they will indicate which particular areas will be focused on. It is as though this is another minister of government operating in a vacuum. It is as though there's no cohesion. They don't sit in the same cabinet. They don't speak to each other. Because, Mr. Deputy Speaker, two years later and there's no policy. No policy. And that same operating in a vacuum is what has costed Remember, the Honourable... Remember, two more minutes. Original time, Mr. Deputy no, Speaker. complete time. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, you know, it was another man in another place who spoke about draining the swamp. And whether or not it is a swamp, and soon thereafter, a member of this house spoke about building houses on Laguna, and the whole country eventually became a lagoon thereafter. But I want to say, whether it's a swamp, whether it's a lagoon, or whether it's a cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago, the Prime Minister must act. The Minister of Finance quoted a prolific Calypsonian when he, saw, when he said, we can make it if we try. I want to quote another Calypsonian. And that Calypsonian's lyrics reminded me so much of this government. When Denise Plummer sang, now leaving, a verse that reminds me of the members on that side, she said, with bubble and scandal, they're boastful and proud, but they're now leaving. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I urge my colleagues to eat some humble pie. Yes. The country already understands you are not working. So at least if you're not working, allow people to like you now. Oh gosh, man. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, they are shameless. Mr. Deputy Speaker, they have no plans, no policies, no ideas. And two years later, it is all about fluff. It is all about rhetoric. It is all about bubble and scandal, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I assure you, as night follows day, Kamala Pusabi Sessa will return as the Prime Minister of this country to take us out of the abyss that the PNM has placed. Yeah. I recognize the member for Darby O'Meara. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to thank you for the opportunity to contribute to this debate on the Appropriations Bill 2018. I would like to congratulate the Minister of Finance for an excellent Mem member, budget statement. Member, member for Coover South, please. Right? Every time you utter, I'm hearing you up at this end. Please, do not continue it. Proceed, member. Yes, I'd like to congratulate the Minister of Finance for an excellent yes. budget statement. Changing the paradigm. Putting the economy on a sustainable path. The Deputy Speaker, I'd like to thank the staff of the W. O'Meara Parliamentary Office for the hard work they have done over the last two years in supporting me. And in particular, I would like to thank my former research officer, Ms. Runa Rogers, for an excellent contribution to the success of the office. I would like to wish her all the best in the future endeavors. Mr. Deputy Speaker, changing the paradigm. Trinidad and Tobago is at a crossroad when we have to change the paradigm. Maybe it would have to change the Trini image you know, that we have in the Caribbean and in the diaspora. I remember 33 years ago on my honeymoon. Yes. Actually, the Friday was my anniversary. And instead of spending it with my other half, I spent it in Parliament here for the entire day. But on my honeymoon in Grenada, 
I had cause to rent a vehicle. And unlike in the United States, when you rent vehicles, it comes with a full tank of gas. At the end of the day, they tell you to refill the gas, or you have to pay at exorbitant prices for it to be refilled. In Grenada, the gas tank was empty. So I drove up to the gas station, and I told the guy, fill him up. And he still, he said, you from Trinidad now? <laughs> and I said, yes, what, what make you ask that? He said, only a Trini go come here and say, fill up my tank. You know the price of gas in Grenada? Right? And that is the, 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 the way we view things in Trinidad and Tobago. We have the lowest price of gas maybe in the hemisphere. Or, uh, the subsidi being subsidized. And we have put forward an image in terms of being Trinidadians. But the finance minister has given us a wake-up call that we need to examine a whole number of things. We need to examine our culture, the way we do things, we do the way we do business. And that would have to be to help us on our way and a path to sustainability. We have to make some adjustments. Yes. We have to make some lifestyle changes. Yes. We have to take on the principle of thrift. And we have to start a plan for the future. In the budget statement, it may mean that we have to take another look at property ownership. As citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, maybe in our planning for the future, we may have to look to own a rental, or sorry, own an apartment first, and then use that apartment later on when our, our budgets, our salaries get greater, to own a single unit. Because a lot of people who come to my office, they're interested in owning a single unit up front. So maybe we have to, to look at the way we view ownership of pro property. We have obviously to prioritize our spending. You know, when I was a little boy growing up, and that was quite a long time ago, Christmas time was the time you saw apples and grapes. It was also a time we saw side drugs and pear drugs. They used to come in a gallon bottle in those days. <laughs> And I think my parents bought it simply because after Christmas, they would take that bottle, that side drugs bottle, that pier drugs bottle, and then we'd buy petrol, you know, to light uh, the, 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 the coal pot and so forth. But around Christmas time, we would never choose pier drugs and side drugs over sorrel and ginger beer. It was there, but our choice was for the local stuff. And maybe we have to go back again looking at how we spend our hard-earned money in terms of what we consume. I see now that we are having four-lane highways. And maybe it is time that the Minister of Works and Transport look at maybe institut instituting HOV lanes, higher occupancy vehicle lanes, are going into Port of Spain. We have people who have three or more persons in their vehicles can use that lane. And then maybe you could think about carpooling so that we all of us not going to Port of Spain, one person driving his car and you know adding to the traffic jams we have on mornings. So in terms of adjusting, we have to look a different way at how we do business. My, my colleague from Maruga Tableland in giving us a little view of the economy over the years says that we have a roller coaster history in terms of the economy. We have had our highs and we have had our lows. I tend to say we have had mountaintop experiences and valley 
experiences. There are times when we are on the mountaintop, when the price of oil and natural gas is very high, so we can afford all sorts of things. But then uh, we go into the valley experience where, like now, things get hard. And we have to adjust. So we go through a bust and boom experience. And the People's National Movement, uh, Mr. De Deputy Speaker, has always been realistic in how we approach and how we train or how we, we, we tell the people of Trinidad and Tobago how they must deal in terms of their situations. Not so our friends on the opposite side, the opposition. I try hard listening to the member for Separia and the other members from the other side to try and put my mind around the contributions and the approach to the budget. And the only thing I come up with is a book I read during school by a guy named George Orwell called Animal Farm. I, I'm sure as you all may be familiar with Animal Farm. And in Animal Farm, the animals came to governance of the farm. And I, there are a lot of lessons to be learned from the book Animal Farm. But I just want to use two of the slogans that were used by the animals. One slogan was, they started off with is, all animals are equal. Another slogan was, four legs good, two legs bad. <laughs> four legs good, two legs bad. But then along came an animal named Napoleon. And Napoleon, during the course of the book, changed things, changed the way the things happened in Animal Farm. At the end of the book, believe it or not, the slogan was changed from all animals are equal to all animals are equal, but as you can see. And then they changed from four legs good, two legs bad, into four legs good, two legs, two legs better. And, you know, trying to get my mind around those on the other side. I look at the, the, the history over the years. Uh, they, are, they, they all came out of the NAR from 1986. The NAR from 1986. And by 1988, they had, some of them have left in Club 88. Not all left at that point in time. I think the member for Karani Central stayed and for Sigonas West, they stayed in the NAR. You know, and they squeezed the NAR dry. <laughs> they didn't follow the, the, the Honorable Basdeo Pandey into Club 88 and to the ULF. Because, Silence. Supram remained as well. Yes. Because... Uh, the Honorable Basio Pandey was a labor leader, you know, and it, it, it's, it's instructive to see uh, his prodigy, uh, Kuva South. Members. And his position, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the opposition bench, Kuva South. But they didn't follow immediately. But lo and behold, after the ULF and the UNC came about, they eventually followed. They eventually eventually joined the UNC. And the UNC morphed or, or evolved into the People's Partnership. By then, they had pulled on some others. My friend from St. Augustine, I'm not seeing him here today, joined. And I, you know, sometimes I'm worried about my friend from St. Augustine. You know, when I came into this honorable house two years ago, he was way up on the other side close to your position, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Like me. No, I was always down on this side. I might have been in the front and in the back now. But I was always down on this side. And you know, I've seen him shift down to this other end. You know, and he was the leader of a particular unit, Congress of the People. And now there's a leadership struggle going on with them. 
and I'm not hearing anything. And sometimes I worry that when I look at him and I don't see my cross there, I might see my cross by the media table, just staring at me from over on that side over there. The way things are going with him, you know, he just keeps shifting to this other end. But again, I'm, I'm trying to put my mind around those on the, the other side. And they keep shifting the goalposts. They keep shifting the goalposts. While the People's National Movement, we deal with our mountaintop and valley experiences, and we try to keep the population on a steady keel. And now that we are in, the, uh, in, a, in a valley experience, we are telling them, look, time has come to tighten your belts. Time has come to revisit how you perceive things. You know, time has come that the price of oil, the price of natural gas is not what it used to be. So therefore, we have to put in some austerity measures. We have to do some adjustments in the way we spend our money. And as I said, maybe the time has come for us to re-examine property ownership and don't go as a young man, a young woman with no sat in a family to own a large single unit house. But maybe the time has come to get a true rent to own an apartment and later on you can sell that apartment and get your dream house. Time has come for us to change how we look at things. But those on the other side, they came into power into governance during a hilltop experience. And all they did was spend, spend, spend. Spend, spend, spend. They, you know, they, 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 they were anti-taxation. Uh, the member for St. Augustine uh, had the axi tax. And I, and, and I keep trying to figure out what is their philosophy? What changed among those on the other side? from the days of NAR and Club 88 to ULF to now? Is it because of Napoleon? Is it because somebody came into their midst and changed their way of thinking that now they are about four legs good and two legs better? All animals are equal, but some are more equal. What changed? On the other side, that they are resisting calls by the Honorable Finance Minister to the population to adjust because the price of oil and the price of natural gas is not what it used to be. Because speaker after speaker come here and they do not seem to want to tell the population that we need to have a reality check. My, my, my friend from San Fernando had to point out to the member from Tabakit because we both got examples of two different articles, the same article by Kutsu, Kitsubero, both the, the, the member for Lopino Bonaire West and Tabakit read the same article and had two different perspectives. perspectives. And he, the wit and satire of Mr. Kisubre was lost on Tabaki. They, 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 they make comparisons, but there was a member of Superior who had a list of spending by our government and made comparisons because she spent a lot of her time trying to justify the spending that they had during their time in government. A time, again, of spend, spend, spend. A time of great schemes. A highway to Point Fountain that was to be spent from, built from recurrent expenditure that we now have to fix to see it to completion. A plan by the, the member for Shigonas West to take water from the Beatum to Labre at over $400 million. 
life support, $420 million. And the member for Tabakit was very good at using a lot of buzzwords, hopelessness, stupor, patriotism. They like to talk about patriotism. But patriotism, when they have money in the Hill experience. But, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have to contend with a changing economy, an economy when things are not what it used to be. And as a result, we have to educate the population that, look, we have to have some adjustments. I heard the, the, the member for Princess Tong uh, speak about uh, AFL and that we should, uh, the, the, this present government should make changes in terms of air travel. But I was a member of the cabinet when a circular was given by the Minister of Finance to review all air travel arrangements in respect of official travel overseas. And I hope that the, the Deputy Speaker allowed me to quote from a document. I have here a circular memorandum, number one dated March 14, 2016. So I wish to inform you that cabinet by minute number 109, second session, dated October 15, 2015, approve revised air travel arrangement in respect of official overseas travel. These arrangements are to be applied with immediate effect. Cabinet took, undertook a review of the current air travel arrangement in respect of official overseas travel in light of the fact that more classes of air travel are now available on many major airlines, which if utilized by the appropriate public officers may facilitate a reduction in public expenditure. And it, it went on to speak about revise of classes of travel, first class travel, the rulers of public office, executive category listed, listed in Appendix 1, shall be entitled to first class travel, business class travel, holders of office in executive category as listed in Appendix 2, shall be entitled to business class travel. I went to premium economy class travel, economy class travel. So a, a circular memo was sent out by this government to all public officials reviewing the air travel. So I just want to, to, to lay to rest that what was brought up by the member for Princess Tong in terms of the official travel. Now, this government took a position to revise the air travel arrangement so that we would reduce the cost of air travel in terms of official going abroad. You know, I find it's really disingenuous you know, for the member for Princess Tong to get up and say that the government of Trinidad and Tobago should ban travel by officials, government officials. If we have to do the business of Trinidad and Tobago, especially in a time of, of recession, especially in a time when the oil prices are not as it was in the past, we have to travel abroad. We have to go and see about government business. So they say just a ban travel is very, you know, irresponsible of the member for Princess Tong. So I hope that would lay to rest uh, his position in terms of official travel. I am the representative for Dabadi Umira. And Dabadi Umira is a constituency along the east-west corridor. We lie to the south of Arima, and we are bordered also by Laoketa, Maloney, and Lopino Bonaire. In terms of demographics, Labudi Omira is a constituency with all types of religion and races. And in terms of the communities that we have in Dabo they, they, they go along a pendulum. From gated communities, we have like the crossings, signature gardens, 
has got to a number of middle-income communities in Malabar, in Dabadi, as Emerald Gardens, Galaxy Gardens, but we also have a number of squatter communities down in Karapo and in Dabadi in a place called Unity. Dabadi Omira, my constituents, has a lot of fears based on the budget. And fears mainly because of the moral of the subsidy on, on fuel prices. Uh, they, they, they expect typical Trinidadians that the, the, the taxi drivers would raise, maxi taxi fares would raise, the food prices would, would rise as well. There'll be an uh, increase in the cost in terms of recreational things like boat rides and bus rides and so forth. So they are there, and as the MP, my responsibility and the responsibility of the government is to let them know that, look, times, we have changing times, and because of the changing times, we have to make some adjustments. And they, and, and they understand that. And there are other areas that they, they have concerns about. In terms of education, we are seeing that the government is spending $7.29 billion on education. Yet in Dawadi Omira, we have a shortage of school places at the primary level. Now, in my constituency, there are a lot of denominational schools. And a lot of the residents are unable to get places in schools because the denominational uh, authorities which give preference to their, 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 their citizens, if you want to say that, before they allow uh, others into their schools. So a lot, a lot of people come to me, a lot of constituents come to me at the beginning of the school term to try to get places in the schools. In terms of the government schools, uh, they will say that we're not in the catchment area. And because you're not in the catchment area, you know, they cannot deal, deal, deal with you. So this is, this, this is an appeal to some of the denominational schools, in particular, for instance, the Pentecostals, who do not have any primary schools and maybe a secondary school down in Central, that time they partner with the, the government in terms of increasing the amount of schools available to constituents in the East-West Corridor. But, but, but there are also other concerns by my constituents in terms of education, especially when we are spending $7.2 billion on education. And this appeal to the principals and the teachers. I know presently I heard the Minister of Education on radio this morning speaking about an incident that took place in a school in the southern area that they are de he's dealing with. And, but I also want to look at the situation where there's a demand for places at the primary level. And of course, at the secondary entry level with the SEA, there's a demand for places in terms of prestige schools and other types of schools. But at the end of the secondary period, what we are seeing coming out of the secondary schools and the, the incident that is taken that is drawing the attention of the Minister of Education right now is one in which we are seeing quite a number of dropouts from the secondary school system. But not only dropouts, we are seeing uh, citizens coming out who are untrainable, and some of them are unemployable. And, and, and this is not something that is the, the and that is why I, I'm saying to the teachers and the principals, etc. This is not something that is a government problem. This is not something that is a government problem, and successive government, governments will have problems with this. But there's a high dropout rate. They are, they, we, we, are, we, are, we are producing young men and young women who are unskilled, untrainable, and unemployable, except for the 
the criminal class in our midst. I had a teacher in Trinity College, name is Charlene Ugle. Me too, me too. You know Charlene Ugle? Excellent lady. Uh, God rest her soul because she passed away some time last year. When we were in third form, Ms. Ugle sometime pulled a number of us in a classroom together. And it was a Friday afternoon, never forget that. And she asked each one of us, tell me what are you all going to do when you leave school? Because at that time, that, that was in the 69, going to 70, the Black Power era, as the case may be. And she asked, what are you all going to do when you leave school? Well, I had, I, at that age, I hadn't given it any thought whatsoever uh, as to what I plan to do when I leave school. And she said, look, and she called a number of, let's put it this way, the one percenters, the children of the one percenters in the school at that time. And she said, so and so, when he leaves school, is going to inherit his father's business. And she called her next one and said, so and so, father owns so and so and so, and his, he, his business is fixed for the rest of his life. And she called out a number of them who are classmates, and at that point in time, we were not thinking so far ahead. She said, what are you all going to do when you leave school? You, what does your father do? And you, what does your father do? And when you look at it, our parents, they didn't have the means to really look after us when we left school. And she said, all right, Monday's a holiday. When you come back Tuesday, I want each one of you all to come and tell me what are your plans for the future. And I went home, and I had some serious discussions with mentally and plus with my parents, and I was able to come back and give Miss Ugle an answer. And I'm ever, forever grateful to Ms. Charlene Ugle for that wake-up call that she gave to, to, to myself and a lot of our classmates uh, at the, when we were going through third form. It set me on the path that I am on today, that I arrive at today. And this is appeal to the principals and the teachers. Uh, in, a, in, in our school system. It's time you take ownership of your product. Your product will be citizens of the future. And you have a responsibility, especially when you're spending $7.2 billion on the education system for this year alone. You have a responsibility to give us some better citizens coming out of the secondary schools. Because, as I say again, we have a demand at the primary school entry level. There's a demand at the secondary school entry level. And therefore, there should be a greater demand at the tertiary level in terms of our citizens. And I do not blame the government. I do not blame the citizen, the opposition. I don't blame, when I say government, I'm speaking of both government and opposition. I don't blame the opposition for this one. We have to get our act together and produce better citizens. And maybe there's a call for tutor as well, as well as the, the minister, Ministry of Education as well. I heard the Minister of Finance said we borrowed four times to pay salaries. And we are borrowing to pay recurrent expenditure rather than capital investments. So therefore, we need to do better. And this is a time we are calling for a wake-up call to the nation. It's a time that we need to re-examine ourselves, re-examine our priorities, a time for, to, for us to examine where we are going forward. In terms of housing in Davao de Omira, the government plans to spend over a billion dollars on housing. And yet, uh, the shortage of housing, we said we have 150,000 applicants. But I heard the Minister of Housing uh, just mentioned around 74,000 applicants. Most of the constituents who come to my constituency office come for two things. Jobs 
or AGC housing. So therefore, I am interested in this proposal put forward by the Minister of Finance about a four-unit proposal. And I, I am thankful that he called it the Tabakit model. I stand correct, it's not a Tabakit model. No, it's not. <laughs> but I also heard the, the Minister of Housing congratulate him as one of the four contractors involved in, uh, in adequate housing. And I like the idea of the four unit proposal for 5,000 square feet. It means that uh, we can look forward to having, again, owning an apartment before we purchase our standalone uh, house, uh, dream house, that we can change the paradigm from big, from big housing schemes to four apartments that we can own and that we can sell later on in life and give somebody a as a chance and own our, our dream, dream, house, dream houses. So I would like to see a further development on the rental proposal. Because a lot of my constituents come to me, they want their own home. They want to own a home. And when I ask questions of them, uh, a lot of them do not have the employment that will allow them to own their own home. And I think that in partnership with, with, with the government that we really have to come out, come up with some deal, some, a, deal, some area where we can help them uh, along the way. And it, again, it calls for education. It calls for changing it in terms of the culture. Because a lot of them really say that rent money is dead money. But the rent to own option is an option that will allow them to get their own dream houses, but let them look at their own dream houses somewhere down in the future. In terms of utilities, the governments intend to spend $3.5 billion on utilities. But I must say that the people of Dabba de Omira, the residents, we are demanding a more efficient water supply in Dabba de Omira. Too long we go without water in Malabar. And the water problem in Trinidad and Tobago is man-made. And I, I'm glad that the member for Shigonas West is here. Trinidad and Tobago experienced enough sufficient rainfall during the course of the year. There's enough surface water. There's enough groundwater. And of course, we, are, we now have desalination water. The problem in Trinidad and Tobago is a water distribution problem. The water is not being distributed properly. And uh, 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 during my, my former stint as, as a, the, the Minister of Public Utilities, I would have spoken to the problems we have in terms of the distribution of, 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 of water. The system that WASA utilized with these pumps, the pump, the, the, the water is not working. Maybe it's time that WASA revisit the tried and tested water system of using gravity through the use of reservoirs on hilltops and water towers. Where the pump nearly, you just need the pump to pump the water up to the reservoir, the water tower, and then let gravity feed the residents in terms of the areas. In terms of the infrastructure in Daba de Omira, the, the population, again because it's along the East West Corridor, we have outgrown the road system and the drainage infrastructure. The Minister of Works visited our area and he ident we identified several critical areas that we need to upgrade and that we need to do some repairs. And that is throughout the, the, the constituency. But also, WASA is upgrading its wastewater project with a project in Malabar, 
Paytonville. The problem that my constituencies, constituents are experiencing is experiencing. It's a failure by WASA to resurface the roads after the pipeline. It, the, 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 the time frame in terms of the repair of Omera Road in particular was too long. And the, the, the recent rains, uh, uh, rains uh, yesterday and day before uh, didn't help at all. And my constituents would like to see a speedier repair of the roads after pipeline by Wasa. In terms of the drainage, Karani River is to the south of Dabadi Umira. And to the west, we have the Mausika River. And to the east, we have the Arima River. So there are rivers all around us. The problem is that we did not took time to develop the drainage infrastructure in the area. And of course, we are building, and I'm thankful to the Minister of Housing for the housing schemes in River on True, Born Air, Trest Trail, and Malabar. Thank you very much. Especially those eyesores that we had in Malabar for all those years. But there are areas in Dabadi in uh, Omira where we need some drainage works. And I, 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 again, when the Minister of Works visited, I pointed out several of these areas, same Joe Trace in Carapo, Ascot Gardens, Carapo, Racecourse Road, Paytonville, Reed Lane, and Boys Lane in Dabadi. <coughs> that we need to have a lot more drainage works so that we could take the water that will come out of these newly established housing schemes to the Karani River and alleviate the flooding that my constituencies, constituents are experiencing. In terms of sporting facilities, Dabadi Mira had the unfortunate experience of Hurricane Anil. Hurricane Anil swept through Dabadi Omira a few years ago with gale force winds of over $420 million with an eye wall, one billion, with an eye wall of life sport. And Hurricane Anil wrecked some of the sporting facilities in Dabodi Omira, in particular India Ground and Burnley Centennial Ground in Karapo. Karapo and Burnley Ground is a, is a cricket area. And they ha we had night cricket going on in Burnley Ground uh, with, the, with, with all the infrastructure. Along came Hurricane Allen and he destroyed the cricket ground. Took down the, 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 the pile on the lights. They're still on the ground. I'm, I'm unable to get T and Tech to put them back up because of the, the cost. I had the Minister of Sports visit uh, Burnley ground as well as India ground. And the constituents of Davide O'Meara, unlike Dominica, and these other places where, you know, they got a lot of support, thank God. And I, I, I want to thank all the Trinidadians who have come forward to assist the people in these unfortunate islands in the Caribbean. And I, I must say that yesterday, speaking to uh, a pastor, from, uh, from Dominica, she was in high praise of the role that the soldiers and sailors and the members of the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force is playing in terms of the support in Dominica. And I want to congratulate the Minister of National Security on the
Uh, members on the government side, please. I'm hearing a constant murmur as we continue along. I'd really like to hear the member for Dabidimor Umera. Proceed. Yeah. So the soldiers, soldiers and sailors are doing an excellent job in terms of assisting. But we were not so unfortunate in terms of the effects of Hurricane Anil on Dabadi Omira. India ground is still, how should I describe it? It, 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 it was an area that the residents told me uh, they had all sorts of activities before the, the creation of Larry Gom Stadium. There's a gentleman named Hackett, uh, an old uh, a resident, former uh, uh, councillor uh, in Arima Borough, who, had, who, who ran a league in India ground. And after Anil, Hurricane Anil left it, uh, it's still in a dilapidated state. I'm hoping that uh, somewhere in his budget uh, for 20, or 2018 is gone already, 2019, that the Minister of Sport would find room to do some work in India Ground and in Karapu on behalf of disaster, disaster repair. So that we would overcome Hurricane Anil, who uh, now has been downgraded. Uh, well, it's not even a tropical depression now. Uh, you don't hear anything about Hurricane Anil. It's just a depression. Yes, yeah, somewhere, somewhere. In terms of health, I would like to thank the, the Minister of Health for the news about the Arima Hospital that would uh, allow the residents of Dabodi Omira uh, medical facilities within uh, easy distance of their homes so that uh, we can see in all these different areas where this government plans to bring some relief to the people of Dabadi Omira during the course of the year. At the same time that the government is telling the, the residents that look, we are having a valley experience. We are no longer on the mountaintops. We no longer have access to all the, the funds that we had in the past, and we have to make some adjustments. The, the, the people of WD Mira appreciate that their best interests will be served by this present government, and that we will do all in our power to make this adjustment as easy as possible, but the fact remains that they will have to adjust. We cannot go on business as usual. We cannot go on same, same. Uh, we, we cannot adopt the... Honorable Member, your original 45 minutes are now spent. You're entitled to 10 more minutes if you wish to avail yourself of it. You may proceed. Yes, Madam, Madam Speaker. So we have to adjust. We cannot adopt the attitude of the, those on the other side. Uh, and at the end of the day, I'm hoping uh, my mentors in the history department of the university, I, you know, I remember Dr. Batiste and Dr. Cato, Dr. Premerton, and even my friend, uh, Dr. Francis here, would in our, in, 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 in our discussions, uh, maybe to help me understand the transformation that took place, uh, those on the other side, on their move from the NAR through Club 88, ULF, UNCA, People's Partnership, and our guest UNCB. I'm sorry that my friend from St. Augustine is not here. 
uh, to, so we can understand really and truly uh, where he fits in this scheme of, scheme of things. Uh, as I said again, I'm not too sure whether he is a uh, Congress of the people or Congress of the person or where he fits in this whole scheme of things. But at least they may, in, when, they're doing, when they're analyzing the situation, explain the change. Is it because of Napoleon? Did the people on the other side uh, have a Napoleon come and transform them into what we are, we, we are seeing today? Uh, it, 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 it is left to, to understand. And I hope that my colleagues will help me and my constituency recover from Hurricane Anil. It's, it's going on, what, three or four years now that Hurricane Allen swept through the body Mira. And I'm hoping that the Minister of Sport would come to the rescue, Minister of Works and Transport, so that we can move forward in terms of the... <laughs> to the development in terms of the Mira. And I want to... Before, before I, I, I end my contribution, again thank the Minister of Finance uh, for having the foresight, but also having the courage to come forth with uh, a budget that tells Trinidadians that we need to uh, have a different perspective on what it is to be a Trini what it is to be a Trini. And a Trini is not just somebody who, uh, you know, throw things out there. But a Trini is somebody who is conscious of the situation he finds himself in. And maybe sometime in the future, we may be having our next mountaintop experience. When we can go out there, you know, and fly the Trini flag, you know, uh, 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 everywhere with everyone but now calls for a different perspective on what it is to be a Trini and how we look at our situation and how we look at our circumstances. That we must have principles of thrift, that we must plan for the future. Maybe we need to revisit our home property ownership and that we can, first of all, own a, an apartment and later on in life, you can sell that apartment and purchase a, a, a single unit for a family as we get older and our, 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 our fortunes increase. So, Madam Speaker, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to make this contribution. Member for Oropuch West. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for this opportunity to contribute to this debate. Before I get into the substantive issues contained in the Budget Statement 2018, Madam Speaker, I would like to congratulate the Leader of the Opposition for her superb contribution. She clearly illustrated the ineptitude and the incompetence of this government. A government devoid of innovative ideas as to how to bring the people out of the sinkhole that we have found ourselves. I will also like to congratulate all the members who have contributed here from this side and I would not forget the member for Coover North for her brilliant run-up before her delivery. I wish, her, I wish her all the best. Also, we cannot forget the dynamic speakers, the member of parliament for Faisabad, the member for Tabakit, and uh, and the Princess Town for their sterling contributions. Madam Speaker, I would look at the overall 
view and give an overall view of the budget. And when we look at this budget, Madam Speaker, a budget must never have the effect of really eroding the middle class in a society, neither should it have the effect of suppressing the working class. And this is exactly what this budget will do. It will place utter hopelessness and gloom on the people of this country. Poverty will increase as the government continues to tax, borrow, and spend. Madam Speaker, if you were to ask a poor man, what is he interested in? Would he tell you that he's interested to find out what is the meaning of a budget deficit? He's not interested in what are called revenue streams. He's not interested in either fixed or floating exchange rate. Madam Speaker, this economic jargon do not excite an old or poor man. What the simple, ordinary man is interested in is how he is going to put food on the table for his hungry children. He wants to know that his family is comfortable, that he can afford to send his children to school to pay his bills. But, Madam Speaker, this budget puts undue burden on the poor man. Madam Speaker, it's no secret that our country is already burdened with several persons who have mental health issues. And this is not a stigma. It's not for persons to be ashamed of. But this budget would really be a stimulus to trigger more mental health problems for our citizens. Madam Speaker, what does a single mother wants to know? What does a single mother want to know? She wants to know that when she hears the cries of her child, she has money to buy the milk for her baby. But this rowley led administration has absolutely nothing in this budget to improve the lives of a poor family. Simply, it's not a people-centered budget, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, when I look at the budget uh, statement 2018, I saw the theme of it says, change in the paradigm. I ask a simple question. Change in the paradigm from what to what? Is it you changing from suffering to more suffering? Are you changing from murders to more murders? Is it, are, you, are you changing from high food prices to prices that are unaffordable? Would there be more job losses? Would a poor man benefit when this paradigm is changed? Or would it continue, would the people continue to exist in a state of hopelessness in this country? Madam Speaker, after I give an overview of this budget, I really want to turn my attention to crime and the failure by this National Security Minister to defend and protect our vulnerable women. I'm also going to deal with the phenomenal levels of child abuse that we are experiencing and how under this government, the right of children to a safe and secure future has been, de has been denied. Madam Speaker, one of the basic rights which is enshrined in the Constitution is the right for security. If we were to see Section 4 of the Constitution, it's the right to be, have security, the right to be protected. That right which is enshrined is now breached by this government because no one feels safe in this country anymore. 
Madam Speaker, despite all the exaggerated tales of anti-crime plans and intelligence, you would hear the Honorable Minister of National Security talking about gathering information and gathering intelligence. Women continue to die as a result of domestic violence and crime. If we were to turn at page, I believe, 74 of the budget statement, you would see words like prediction, deterrence, detection, prosecution, and rehabilitation. Madam Speaker, for the last two years, I've, I've, I have been hearing these words. And what do, do these words mean? These words used in a vacuum do not mean anything. These words must be put to action. Yeah. And Madam Speaker, in light of what I've just said, women need to be heard in this parliament. And today, each violated woman, each woman who has died through violence will be heard through my voice as I speak in this parliament. No longer will there be mere statistics, but their cries will from this moment haunt the ears of those placed in the corridors of power in this nation. I intend to awaken this nation, Madam Speaker, to the reality of disrespect and extreme violence that is a lot of so many of our women. Madam Speaker, this reminds me of the words of our goodwill ambassador for the UNIFEM, Nicole Kidmon. And I quote, I have learned that violence against women knows no boundaries. Violence against women is an appalling human rights violation. But it is not inevitable. We can put a stop to this. And I ask, can this government put a stop to it? Madam Speaker, I say this in light of the ill treatment faced in our country every day by our women. This government, insensitive and incompetent, has totally disregarded the cries for action from the citizenry. Many groups have outlined the need for a plan to treat with the rising heinous crimes against our women and children. Madam Speaker, in the budget of 116 pages, only two lines were mentioned about domestic violence and the heinous attack on women, with absolutely no plan to the way forward to curb this crisis. Well, after you were treated, Madam Speaker, it is a fact that 41 women were murdered in 240 days in this country. The country deserves to know what this administration intends to do about this epidemic. Madam Speaker, nowhere in this budget is there any programs in place to protect our women. The People's Partnership government was a caring government. We cared for our women. We cared for our children, and we cared for the elderly. This government makes it a habit to blame the opposition for their inability to govern this country. They say they are in charge, but they rock back and do nothing. Madam Speaker, let's turn our attention to what the citizens have to say about violence against women under this government. And if we were to look at an express article on the 6th of December 2016, it reads, domestic violence against women has reached epidemic levels in Trinidad and Tobago, with more than 10,000 women seeking restraining orders every year. Director of Gender Affairs Division, Office of the Prime Minister, Antoinette Jack Martin said that. She said that these figures are unacceptably high and alarming. Madam Speaker, Diana Mahabir Wyatt, Guardian article, 15th of February 2017, said, 
Rowley ought to be a role model to men and exemplify what men should not be doing rather than blaming women's choices. Women were being blamed for not choosing properly rather than the perpetrator being blamed for their action and violence. She noted, Madam Speaker, that the office of the Prime Minister included a ministry dealing with women affairs. And Madam Speaker, it's no secret that the Honorable Prime Minister, the choice of words, the unsavory and unpalatable words he used to describe women in this country. Total disrespect. Cross, cross. Madam Speaker, <clears throat> the head of the Institute for Gender Development Studies, Dr. Gabriel Hussein, said a number of cases involving abuse of women in which they were assaulted or murdered was specifically about intimate partner violence. It's abbreviated IPV. And we ask, what does that mean? Is that there is something that is missing in terms of women who are experiencing any level of IPV being able to successfully get protection from social services. Madam Speaker, all these social commentators all have recognized that we have a huge problem. This government is in charge two years now, but not a ray of hope for our women. <laughs> Madam Speaker, as part of the special focus on this event, the Trinidad and Tobago Guardian on the 8th of March 2017 asked a sample of women across the country to state their biggest concern at this point in time. And Madam Speaker, if you allow me, the responses were as follows. We had a stay-at-home mom, she said, the disappearances and kidnappings of young women. I have a young daughter. I worry about going out in public and someone snatching her away because you don't even know when you are being targeted. Real, very real. You have a student, Madam Speaker, she said. My safety as a student is especially frightening, walking the streets by yourself. You have to be wary of every taxi you get in, and try to take pictures of the car or the driver just to have peace of mind when traveling. A program officer said, violence against women is my biggest concern in this country. As a mother, I am fearful for my child's safety. Madam Speaker, these are the voices of the women in Trinidad and Tobago. They are afraid. And why it is that women must be afraid to walk this land? Why it is women must be afraid to get into their vehicles and not watch around? Why it is sh should that happen in this country? We are in the 21st century. Madam Speaker, let us look at what is said about us internationally. How we are painted internationally. Madam Speaker, just a few weeks ago, U.S. crime fighting expert, former Attorney General and Congressman for the State of California, Don Lundgren, was a speaker at the Caribbean Security Forum in Trinidad. In a Guardian article, September 25th, he said, 2017, that Trinidad and Tobago is rated by the U.S. Department as critical in terms of its crime level. He indicated that the highest level of crime they could give to any country. Madam Speaker, he said this is the highest level of crime one can give to any country. Madam Speaker, do you know when countries are listed as critical what it means? It means that countries prone, these countries are prone to terrorist attacks such as Afghanistan, Chad and Algeria, narco states such as Colombia and Mexico. Madam Speaker, this is where we have reached under this so-called 
caring government, clueless and hopeless without a plan. Madam Speaker, this is the view of the United States. This is the view they have formulated about us. So tell me how much of that $17 billion spent on crime fighting for the last two fiscal years were used to protect our women. And they always speak about value for money, Madam Speaker. But what value are we receiving? <coughs> Madam Speaker, there's something called Al Jazeera News. It is a news channel, um, channel stationed at Qatar, Doha in Qatar. On the 14th of February, 2017, a documentary was done in Trinidad. And the topic, domestic violence in Trinidad and Tobago, a look at the issues driving violence against women. And I quote, Madam Speaker, a young woman was working in her restaurant job at a popular movie town complex in Trinidad capital when she got a phone call from a man she knew. Shortly after leaving to meet him, she was found with her throat slit in a parking lot. The victim of what police are calling now a domestic dispute. It went on. The 27-year-old death earlier this month is one in a string of high-profile killings of women on this dual, tiny island, Caribbean nation of 1.3 million people. Madam Speaker, this is what is happening under this government. We didn't make Al Jazeera news because of some accomplishment, Madam Speaker, or some outstanding achievement. We made Al Jazeera news because of the slaughterhouse we have now found ourselves in under this government. <laughs> Madam Speaker, in one of the Prime Minister's so-called conversations. The Honorable Prime Minister said, you call on the Prime Minister to do something about crime. I am not in your bedroom. I am not in your choice of men, unquote. Madam Speaker, how much more uncaring and callous a Prime Minister can be when the society is looking up for some sort of comfort Today, Madam Speaker, I am saying, nor may be the time, nor may be the time for the Honorable Attorney General to bring legislation to this Parliament to legalize pepper spray, to get tasers, Madam Speaker, because women need to arm themselves. Women need to protect themselves. Madam Speaker, Palmis ground which is in San Fernando, Philippine. Philippine. Women walk there, but you know what? They are scared because there were numerous cases where women were pulled in the bushes and raped, and why that should happen. You cannot enjoy the ambience. You cannot enjoy pristine nature. Why should that be, Madam Speaker? Madam Speaker, Violence against women and Trinidad has been on the rise since this government came into office. And we are talking about value for money. I said $17 billion of taxpayers' money spent in the last two fiscal years by the Ministry of National Security and nothing to show. Sorry, right. Madam Speaker, in 2016, with the ComStat uh, report, Madam Speaker, there were 200 reports of missing women ranging from 12 to 40. Usually, Madam Speaker, people would say that teenage children may have some fight with their parents and run away. So that may be. But what about the girls who go missing and turn up dead? What happened to those girls? And they are dead, Madam Speaker, because we have cases where we have young women found three days later down a precipice. We had a bank employee found dead. Their top series veil, she was smothered. We have another young woman who was found dead, Mon Coco Road, Pitti Valley, 
what the autopsy revealed? Her neck was broken. These kind of heinous crimes against our women, Madam Speaker. What about the murders that go cold in this country? What about the Japanese pan player who was found dead last year, Ash Wednesday? What become of that case? Madam Speaker, we still have persons who are missing. San Fernando, we had a beautiful young missing businesswoman last seen in her Cedar Drive home in Palmese, September 11, 2015. We had our next beautiful hairdresser abducted at the corner of Papuri Road, went to drop off her two children. No closure for that family. Those two persons cannot be found, and there are more. There are other missing young girls, 17 year, 15 year, and 16 year old girls. And then we could ask a question. Perhaps if we turn our attention to the global phenomena, Madam Speaker, of human trafficking. And if we look at the recently published Trafficking in Persons Report 2017, we can safely say that we are not receiving any value for money under this government. Madam Speaker, this report, the Trafficking in Persons Report 2017 said, the government of Trinidad and Tobago does not fully meet the minimum standards for the elimination of trafficking. The government did not meet the minimum standards in several key areas. It has yet to secure a conviction under its anti-trafficking law. The government decreased funding for its anti-trafficking unit and victim care. Victims were not provided specialized services including during legal proceedings. The government did not have policies or laws regulating foreign labor recruiters and had no basis for holding them civilly and criminally liable for fraudulent rec recruitment. Madam Speaker, this is the government that said they had all the answers. But all this is happening under their watch. Red and ready. Madam Speaker, no one really is immune to the scourge of violence. In Trinidad, usually you reach 60 years. You may believe that it's time for you to rock back and enjoy your retirement. But one may think, after working all your life hard, Madam Speaker, you can be murdered. In 2017 alone, we had nine women, Madam Speaker, over the age of 60, brutally murdered. Nine men over the age of 60 were killed, with the oldest being 87 years old. 87. And if it is that I may only be talking about, about a female, weekend there was a man, 87 year old man, stuffed in a barrel. Madam Speaker, so we have many instances where pensioners are being kidnapped for their life savings. Madam Speaker, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, we know we are in trouble. International institutions know we are in trouble. So when will this government realize that we are in trouble? When will it ever give us a plan, Madam Speaker, to protect our women? We have infants being killed. The leader of the opposition spoke about the thrown in the beat em in landfill, Madam Speaker. And uh, there were some conversations at Pigot's Corner, Madam Speaker, Friday. And the Prime Minister of this country totally misconstrued what the leader of the opposition said about teenage pregnancy and teenage mothers who do not want the babies. Madam Speaker, the leader of the opposition said that in some states of Africa where you do not want the baby, there's a receptacle where you can place the child. It sends off an alarm 
and the persons in the institution will receive the baby for the safety of the child, not to throw a child in a beat-up or a landfill, Madam Speaker. And the, the Honorable <coughs> Prime Minister went on to say that that is the, the strategy <coughs> the leader of the opposition want to use. Put your child and ring a bell and run away. What does that supposed to mean? You're totally misleading the nation of what the leader of the opposition was saying. Totally misleading. <coughs> Madam Speaker, when we look at the children's homes, <laughs> just a couple of weeks ago, Madam Speaker, the Children's Authority disclosed, and I quote, that persons cur currently operating the home at Calder Hall, Tobago, are neither qualified nor licensed to do so. It is even more alarming that this home is under purview of the Tobago House of Assembly's Division of Health and Social Services. Madam Speaker, we have a government funding an illegal organization that can cause more harm than good to, the, to our innocent children. <coughs> Madam Speaker, the Children's Authority is saying this. It's not any of us here on the UNC side saying anything like that. They're saying, I hope that the fraud squad will investigate the situation to ascertain who owns this facility so we can retrieve the squandered funds. Madam Speaker, and we have different homes in this country. We have St. Michael Home for boys. We have St. Jude's Home. And we know of all the different things that happen. We have ch children being missing and not being found in some of these homes. And Madam Speaker, with a few more minutes that I have, I want to turn my attention to the constituency, to my constituency, Madam Speaker. And on June 19th, Orapuch West was one of the worst hit constituency. It was struck by a very eventful phenomenon called Brett, Storm Brett. Madam Speaker, over 600 persons either lost their roofs, crops, livestock, many families lost clothes, school uniforms for their children, yes. household appliances. Oops. Homes are ravaged. Madam Speaker, the people in Orbuch West were marooned. They could not get out of their homes for days. We had flood in San Francisco, flood in Suche Trace, woodland, Durbasa Trace, Madam Speaker, those of us who know such a trace will know lots of persons plant agriculture there. We have acres of corn, acres of sweet potato, acres of peas, and were all covered. They were all covered with water. Most of those persons, Madam Speaker, were either referred to the Ministry of Social Development or Ministry of Agriculture. Not a single help to date from either the Ministry of Social Development or the Ministry of Agriculture. But for, Madam Speaker, the kind assistance of different NGOs, we had to get these people out and get them in safe institutions for overnight and to replace mattress, to replace food, to give them shelter, to give them water, and we did not have any person from social development or the Ministry of Agriculture coming to check any of these people. We had to, Madam Speaker, I have to give special thanks to ITNAC, an NGO from Diego Martin, the Christian Monday from San Fernando, we had the Prince's Strong Open Bible Church, we had the Sai Baba Foundation. They were all able to rescue the constituents, Madam Speaker. To date, not a single help. And you know, Madam Speaker, perhaps I could 
as the member for Laventy West, because we are seeing now Maraval flooding, Santa Cruz flooding, Diego Martin flooding, and perhaps I would ask him if he want to redefine what an alligators in a murky lagoon mean. Madam Speaker, when we look at housing, Oropuch West, we have over 27,000 electorates. Oropuch West, who could vote? Madam Speaker, the number of applications for 27,000 constituents, the application with 20 homes, 20 from 27,000. We had to calculate what percentage is that. I have written the Minister of Housing. I have, Madam Speaker, a pile of letters. A pile of letters, Madam Speaker, a pile. And you know what? Not a single acknowledgement. Not a single saying, I have received your letter dated X, and I'm giving attention to it. Not two lines. Arrogant and you know what, Madam Speaker, world. every time you ask and ask, said, what about the house for X or Y, they reduce every serious question in this parliament to a joke. They make it be sound facetious every time you ask about a serious issue. Can you please support it by Lavender West? What is the name of the lady? Madam Speaker. Is it Margaret? It really breaks my heart to know what my constituents have been going through, what they are going through. And I heard the honorable member for Diego Martin, Central, Central Minister of Sport. Yesterday, I sat in this parliament, this August, August chambers, Madam Speaker, and I listened carefully. I'm sorry, Madam Speaker, last Friday. Friday. Last Friday. 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 And the number of projects I heard being done in the north of Trinidad, I thought to myself, Oropuch West is not one of those constituencies, not one of the 41 constituencies in this country. Because the number of things I heard, in fact, I heard Laventy West is getting a swimming pool. I have absolutely no objection to that. That is what he said. The Minister of, the minister of, the, of Sport said he's going to do that. I have no objections, Madam Speaker. But the people in Oropuch West, they can swim too. They know how to swim. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. I heard the minister said, said all the different the lighting arrogant. that is happening in all these different the constituencies arrogant. north. He had written the minister, the minister of public utilities. But, mini but Madam Speaker, the minister of public utility, I could accept there might be an inordinate delay because we do not know who Who's really that? is the minister of public utility. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I recall writing a letter one Friday to the Minister of Public Utilities, and by Sunday I had to change the letter. <laughs> so I, I could accept there might be some delay, you but it cannot continue indefinitely. Delays like this. Five of them. <laughs> Madam, <laughs> Madam Speaker, including the member for David O'Meara, yeah, he so wants to be acknowledged. He do a poor job, nobody can survive it. <laughs> Madam, <laughs> Madam Speaker, again, the Minister of, of Sport said that some particular cricketer needed a house. All he had to do was call the member for San Fernando East because his house was, he did not get it when he had applied. Minister, he just take one phone call, give it to San Fernando East. Minister of Housing, the House was approved. Madam Speaker, in constituency of Oropuch West, 
we have cricketers there, and especially Madam Speaker, there's a cricketer who so plays in the CPL. John Ross Jagasa, why is it he's not getting his house? I have to be writing, writing the minister. Carbon copy in the Minister of Sport. And again, not a single acknowledgement. Why is it, Madam Speaker, you, you must have what is called equitable distribution of resources. That is what it is. Violating all the rules. We have a young woman, cricketer, Urupuch West, a young woman. She's a bat woman. And she also, Madam Speaker, is a pace bowler, Samantha Bisoon. I heard the minister said he got 45 scholarships and given out. I hope that Samantha Bisoon gets one so she could go to Australia and fine tune her bowling. Don't forget Samantha Bisoon, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, in closing, of I had one member, Lopino Bonnet. I think um, the member for Kumuto Manzalena will deal with the social services. But one point that stood out, Madam Speaker, she said, and I quote the honorable member, the country was left bankrupt. I want to remind her, is this budget is bankrupt, Madam Speaker, and I thank you. Member for St. Anne's East. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to rise and to contribute in this budget debate 2017. Madam Speaker, I've heard other speakers speak about their long years in the Parliament and the uh, number of contributions they have made. And uh, I am certain, Madam Speaker, that they would be challenged as long as they have been here to have been subject to uh, more depressing contribution than the one we were just subject to in this house. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I, I know the member referred to, you know, um, the budget causing mental issues, and I don't know, Madam Speaker, if there's some level of depression happening, but if we stand here to recount every bad thing that has happened in this country, I'm certain, Madam Speaker, that over this year, over the last years, certainly under 2010 to 2015, we can have a long list if we all sit to just do that. And therefore, I want to thank God, Madam Speaker, for the PNM and the hope yeah. that this government brings to Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, as I thank the ministers of finance and planning for what they would have done in ensuring that this country in 2017 receives a budget that really hits down the middle and makes the best attempt to give Trinidad and Tobago a fighting chance in 2017. I want to remind us that things are difficult. Yes, they are in this country and around the world, but it is not impossible. The PNM has done it before and we will do it again. Yes. Madam Speaker, I heard the member speaking about the caring UNC and the uncaring PNM. And uh, I also heard her speaking in so at length about the, the women and the children and the problems that they are undergoing. And I just wanted to remind the member for Oropooch West that it is the caring UNC when the children's marriage bill was being debated, brought a temporary senator into the other place who as much as said after 12 is lunch, Madam Speaker, once they are seeing their periods, they are ready for marriage. I want to remind them that was not the PNM, that was the very caring UNC who did that. So Madam Speaker, let me get into the meat of my presentation and begin to contextualize my presentation today by taking another look, just a very brief look again at the finances of this country because it, it, it bears repeating, Madam Speaker, so that everyone can really understand and accept what we are going through. Sometimes when we hear the numbers in terms of billions, it doesn't compute, you don't relate to it because it's, it's, it's far 
removed from our circumstances. And so when we say that in 2014, our petroleum revenue was 20.9 billion and is reduced now in 2017 to 2.8 billion, an 86% drop, maybe it does not compute. Madam Speaker, when we say that the total energy revenue in 2014 being 20 billion is now down in 2017 to 9 billion, a 68% drop, maybe the figures are too large. But if we think about it in terms of a salary, a household income, all of us live in houses, all of us balance our budgets every day. And if we think about a household that has been receiving $8,000 a month in income, and that income is reduced to $2,560, it becomes a little clearer the situation Trinidad and Tobago is in. And if that salary was $5,000 a month, Madam Speaker, the circumstances we are in today has reduced that to an estimated $1,600 dollars a month and as homemakers what would we do if that were our circumstance what would we do how would we operate our business how would, would it be business as usual and madam speaker as a household we can now extend that to government what do, does the government do when placed in those circumstances of reduced revenue sharp as it is madam speaker allow me to just look a little bit at three examples of responses to these types of situations i want to look at the nar's response in 1980 in the 80s, Madam Speaker, and we're all familiar with what happened there, sharply reduced revenue, and the NAR attempted to reduce expenditure. And to do that, Madam Speaker, they had a drastic downsides of the public sector, reduction in public sector salaries, and we know the results of that, of choosing that option to reduce expenditure. Catastrophic on the country, and I, would, I dare say that we are still reeling in some aspects from the result of that decision to choose to do that to reduce expenditure. Madam Speaker, if we look at the response of the UNC during 2010 to 2014, where the revenue was pretty much stagnant, what was their response? And their response was actually to increase spending. So imagine you are in a household and your income is the same over the years, but in four years, Madam Speaker, with, with constant and stagnant revenue, the UNC's response was to raise expenditure to the tune of $16.1 billion from $46.7 billion in 2010 to $62.8 billion in 2014. And concurrent with that came a sharp increase in the price of government projects. Madam Speaker, what should have cost $4 million, cost $40 million, $400 million? It seems that there was no scale. There was no multiplier. It was just whatever you felt to multiply this by. And what was the result of that? And I like, and I want to congratulate the Minister of Finance for using the term false economy. That is important. It's a good term to use. False economy. Because that is where you would describe the inflated perception of this country's wealth. People honestly felt we had more money than the government had. And on top of that came ex exaggerated expectations of what people should receive. And up to now, Madam Speaker, there's a total unwillingness in the population to believe and to accept our financial circumstances. And a belligerence in the population demanding that they should get what they do not know is there for them to get, Madam Speaker. I myself have experienced numerous phone calls, texts, people showing up in my office even, Madam Speaker, to bully for money that they believe is their own because they have an unreal understanding of what our circumstances are in this country. And when, Madam Speaker, the leader of the opposition stands in the parliament and says words to the effect that things are not as bad as we are making it out to be, Madam Speaker, then that leads to the type of confusion that we have going on in our society today, and it leads to that false economy. Madam Speaker, the TT Chamber of Commerce on Friday, October the 6th, said very clearly, it should be clear to the entire population that the nation is facing an unprecedented economic situation. So business community recognizes it, this government recognizes it, but leaders that we expect better of stand in the parliament to mislead the population and to deliberately confuse the issues. And I saw the member for Princess Town is absent from his seat now, but I'm, I saw him introducing into the debate, you know, that the um, PNM is throwing shade. Madam Speaker, let me tell you something. The PNM doesn't throw shade. We plant trees under which other people take shade. That's what we do in the PNM. 
We don't plant, we don't take shade. And as a matter of fact, we throw spotlights on the issue and last two weeks, you would have seen the spotlight being thrown on the real circumstances. Madam Speaker, how does the PNM respond to this situation? And I'm going to quote two examples of the PNM undergoing situations where the revenue is declining. 2007 to 2010, when we are faced with declining revenues, what did the PNM do? Reduced expenditure by 7.1 billion. And again, in 2015 to 2017, Madam Speaker, against all the odds, the PNM has been successful in introducing fiscal measures that have reduced our expenditure by 20%, $12 billion. And Madam Speaker, every minister here is to be congratulated for the efforts they would have made to make this a reality. <laughs> Madam Speaker, this PNM government continues to deliver strong, responsible, and measured leadership. We understand that things have to be different and we have to adjust to our new normal. But the measures we have implemented have ensured that we reduce our expenditure without disrupting as much as possible the quality of life of our citizens, a measured approach to doing it. And of course, with maintaining critical investment in national development. And that's why I congratulated the ministers of planning and finance. It is a balance. We have to achieve that balance in unable to go forward as a country even as we make our adjustments. Madam Speaker, as we speak about national development, the Ministry of Community Development, Culture and the Arts is one of the essential plays one of the essential roles in human development in Trinidad and Tobago. In times of financial adjustments such as we are experiencing right now, critical factors or critical types of uh, um, ex experiences for our people in this country, our citizens, would be adaptability. We have to maintain our adaptability, which is the ability of all of our citizens to accept our changing circumstances. We have to maintain optimism, Madam Speaker, optimism, which is what the member for Orapuch West showed none of in her, in, her, in her contribution. Bad times do not last. We have been through bad times before. They do not last. And Madam Speaker, the third quality that we have to hone in our citizens in times of financial adjustment would be patriotism. And patriotism is not just waving a flag. Waving a flag, anybody can do that. But patriotism is love for country as well as the willingness to work for its development. So adaptability, optimism, and patriotism, these are the three qualities that our citizens need. And allow me to just quote from Dr. Eric Williams in his 1962 Independence Address where he said, the strength of the nation depends on the strength of its citizens. And let me repeat that. The strength of the nation depends on the strength of its citizens. And Madam Speaker, that is why in times of financial adjustment, it is important to have all of the fiscal measures, but it's equally important to devote and to invest in the quality of citizens that we are producing, because on the quality of the citizens lies the strength of the nation. And Madam Speaker, this is where the work of the Ministry of Community Development, Culture and the Arts is focused on the development of our citizens. Let us look at the aspiration statement of Vision 2030, Madam Speaker, because as you contextualize this human development, emphasis on citizenry, we have to look at where the PNM government sees this country going at the year 2030. So I'm going to paraphrase, Madam Speaker, allow me to. The vision, aspiration statement of Vision 2030. We are a united, resilient, productive, innovative nation with a disciplined, caring, fun-loving society comprising healthy, happy people with self-reliance, respect, tolerance, equity, inclusion, and integrity. The diversity and creativity of all people are valued and nurtured. And along with that aspiration goes the development theme number one, which says, putting people first, nurturing our greatest asset. <coughs> putting people first, nurturing our greatest asset. And Madam Speaker, these themes wholly encapsulate the work of the Ministry of Community Development, Culture, and the Arts. 
So allow me, Madam Speaker, at this point, to go into what the work of the ministry encapsulates. And we see our role happening in 10 different areas. Excuse me. And those 10 areas, Madam Speaker, would be policy formation, skills training, artist development, community entrepreneurship, community and performance infrastructure, immersion in culture and the arts, personal development, support for community initiatives, <coughs> heritage preservation, and support and development of the cultural tourism products. This is a very broad ministry, Madam Speaker. And at this time, I'm going to go into these 10 areas, what we have done for 2017, and how we intend to proceed for 2018. Madam Speaker, in terms of policy formation, policies are very important to us at the ministry because they help us to chart the way forward, make our objectives clear, they allow us to inculcate monitoring and evaluation strategies into the programs that we are running, and of course, allow us to look for the effectiveness, whether we have achieved our objectives, and whether we have achieved value for money, which again is very important. And so in 2017, Madam Speaker, we would have developed the community development policy, the culture and the arts policy, as well as a policy for support to the museum sector. These discussion papers have been developed and they will be out for public comment before the end of 2017, calendar 2017. And we intend to finalize these policies in the year to come so that they are enacted and they are enforced in the ministry for 2018. Madam Speaker, I'm sorry the, the, the member for Princess Town is not here because I know he mentioned the funding policy which has been enforced since 2016, Madam Speaker. We came in, met none in 2015 and made sure that we developed that since 2016. So member, I hope wherever you are, you're listening and you know that we have already been there and done that. Madam Speaker, with respect to our subvention policy, the ministry distributes over $4 million in grants every year and we met no subvention policy at the ministry and therefore we have gone to cabinet and gotten a policy approved because we think it's important for a reporting relationship to be very firmly established between those who receive government subventions and we have dedicated staff to have that particular oversight <laughs> because we want to ensure that there's value for the money that is given to these NGOs that receive it. In the area of skills training, Madam Speaker, the well-known community education program is still running in the ministry and what we do every year is look to see which communities want which different skills and add them on to our arsenal. <coughs> this year, Madam Speaker, we were able to have over 7,500 graduates in the ministry, through the ministry's program, sorry, in the different communities out of 400 classes. And most importantly, Madam Speaker, very importantly, 245 tutors were employed and gained temporary employment in this community education program. For 2018, we want to continue this and to encourage non-traditional participation because there are many people who do not participate because they don't know. So we are encouraging, um, putting, out, putting it out there, sensitizing persons so that more people can take advantage. Because in this time, Madam Speaker, we can use this as a skills training, retraining type of program for persons who may need it if they are out of the job market or if they need to supplement their salaries. Madam Speaker, in the area of artist development, <coughs> allow me to mention our long-running Best Village program, which caters to over 12,000 participants in 2017, more than 70% of them being under the age of 25. Madam Speaker, in 2016, I would have promised to increase the training so that we increase the quality of the artists coming out of the Best Village program. I would have promised to increase the prizes, to reintroduce the food and folk fair, so that we enhance our culinary arts, our traditional and local culinary arts in this country, to maintain the Junior Best Village, which is a program that in 2017 saw a participation of over 800 students all over the country in the vacation period, learning about our culture and heritage, to introduce a folk 
theatre season, the first ever folk theatre season, where the best productions of the best village folk theatre productions are put on for the general public's edification and to re-establish the Tobago participation, participation in Best Village. Madam Speaker, I am happy to report that all of these have been accomplished to the joy of the Best Village community and most importantly, without increasing the budget that was allocated to Best Village. Madam Speaker, this is a program that employs again over 200 tutors annually. So it's not just learning about culture, the arts, and being an artist, but it's also an employment strategy for many people in the arts, Madam Speaker. And of course, it affects many spin-off industries, dressmakers, production technicians, choreographers, producers, creative directors, makeup artists, and many more. So this very pivotal program, Madam Speaker, we continue to work with this program and to work with the young people who are involved in this program and to ensure that as one of the most important programs in this country, it is continued with the degree of excellence that, it, that we are working towards. Madam Speaker, let me mention other artist development programs such as Mentoring by the Masters, where we had seasoned professionals such as Sharon Pitt in Broadcasting, Roslyn Gabriel in Carnival Arts, Lionel Jacasa in Fancy Indian Mass, Patricia McLeod in the Orisha Traditions, Simeon Sandiford in Music Production. We had 85 <coughs> students being able to sit with them in a mentorship arrangement for 12 weeks and to learn from them. And these students were handpicked so that they were artists already, so that they were able to get in their particular field of practice, the tips and the tricks and the knowledge transfer necessary to increase the quality of the artists that they could be to this country, Madam Speaker. We also ran technical camps. More than 100 young people from the age of 18 to 25 were able to learn advanced skills in terms of visual arts, stage makeup, fashion design, etc. 11 camps ran around the country in 2017, Madam Speaker. Handicraft workshops, and all we're speaking still about developing artists. Look at the different areas that we are touching, Madam Speaker. Handicraft workshops, because we are seeking in the Ministry of Community Development, Culture and the Arts to revitalize the craft industry. Madam Speaker, this industry has tremendous economic potential. In many of the Latin American countries, there are a number of people in Colombia, for example, over one million people employed directly in the craft sector. And so we see this as an area that we can work on and revitalize to make sure that there are many people who can take part in it and ensure that they will be able to either diversify their own income into their households or form new streams of revenue. Madam Speaker, we held two, shops, two such workshops coming out of the Handicraft Symposium that we held in July, and that was one of the recommendations coming from the handicraft artisans themselves. They wanted to increase training in different areas, such as economies of scale, social media marketing, to bring handicraft into, the, 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 into 2017. And we have started that thrust, and we intend to continue it as we go into 2018. Madam Speaker, let me also mention that the Ministry of Culture, with the responsibility for culture, sees itself as a bridging ministry between the ministries of trade and tourism, Madam Speaker, because we see our role as the development of the artists, where trade now, where the creative industries lie, would take the artists and monetize the cultural product, and of course tourism would take the cultural product and it, um, advertise it internationally. And we have had discussions with both Film TT and the Trinidad and Tobago Film Festival, and we are preparing to implement, it's already drafted, we are preparing to implement a program in 2018 where we partner together to offer funding for developing filmmakers to take them from the idea straight up to the production of the film and the showing of the film in the TT Film Festival. So Madam Speaker, we are playing our role. We have also been discussing um, with Music TT the plan to leverage the success of our very own Calypso Rose in Europe and how we can use that door that has been opened to allow other artists to pass through. Madam Speaker, a plan has been um, drafted and we are seeking its implementation in 2018. 
But I'm speaking in the area of community entrepreneurship. Let me mention very importantly that we held a craft market in September at Napa. Very successful. Over 60 artisans took part and they recorded sales of over $57,000. And we are looking forward, Madam Speaker, instituting a craft market every quarter so that the ministry can facilitate these artisans having a consistent space to show the country what they can produce and for the country to understand what is possible to be bought here and to buy local, Madam Speaker. So we are going forward with that thrust. Let me mention as well, Madam Speaker, as we speak about community entrepreneurship, there's one project that is very near and dear to our hearts at the ministry. And we met with the groups operating in the area of Lavantil. And they all spoke to us about this particular group of young men who trying to avoid the problems that may be associated with crime, started a tilapia rearing business in Lavantil, in the hills of Lavantil. And they needed some grant funding to assist them with their rearing of the tilapia. And they also needed some training in some of the technical areas. Madam Speaker, as I speak today, those young men are in classes in electrical and plumbing to be able to manage their fish tanks. That is the work of the ministry, adding value in communities. And we intend to continue providing that to the subsets of communities in the country, Madam Speaker. Let me mention community and performance infrastructure, Madam Speaker, very quickly. Community centers, we all know, are the hubs for community development. And every member of Parliament knows the importance of providing those things to their communities. Madam Speaker, in 2017, we were able to open six new centers refurbish five centers. There are presently four centers under construction, six centers being refurbished, which will be con um, completed by January 2018. Contracts have been awarded for the construction of 11 centers and the refurbishment of four centers, and we intend in 2018 to continue our drive on prioritizing the delivery of these community centers all around the country, even as far as five back. Madam Speaker, we would have said in 2016, I would have stood in this house and said that the activity centers, which unfortunately were built without approval, are handed over to members of parliament, and therefore no plan was in place for their upkeep and maintenance. I said in 2016, we were going to seek to take them under the ministry's wing, regardless of how they were built, and we are going to make sure that we take them under the wing to put them to maximum use. Madam Speaker, I'm happy to report that has been done. Allow me to thank UDICOT through the Ministry of Housing for their sterling efforts are delivering these community centers. They really have been pulling us out very well, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, allow me to speak a little bit about Napa, because I heard the again the member for Princess Town. He, he ran away. But I want to mention to him that he saw $2 million in the budget for Napa. Well, thank God, because in 2010 to 2014, there was nothing in the budget to maintain Napa, Madam Speaker. Imagine investments like that in this country, no maintenance plan. Madam Speaker, I want to indicate that we have been able to sign the first ever maintenance plan for Napa and Sapa to ensure that they are kept up to the quality that they should be as major investments in this country. Madam Speaker, allow me to also mention that Queen's Hall and Naprima Bowl have not been left out. And if the member had looked very carefully in its budget documents, he would have seen money for them too. Because as our, our um, performance spaces that have stood at us through the test of time, we are also making sure to upgrade them. And so Queen's Hall and Naprima Bowl would have gone through upgrades this year to their seating, their lights, their audio, bathrooms, dressing rooms, carpet, all of that has been done because, Madam Speaker, a building requires maintenance and money is required to maintain a building. And everyone that goes into these performance spaces, every artist knows the importance of maintaining these spaces so that everyone in this country can benefit from them. And so, Madam Speaker, we will continue those upgrades in 2018. Let me mention the area of immersion in culture and the arts, Madam Speaker. This is important as we create audiences for our artists. It's important for artists to perform and to perform to people who appreciate that. Madam Speaker, 
the National Performing Entities, the National Steel Symphony Orchestra, the National Philharmonic Orchestra, the National Theatre Arts Company have been involved in putting on productions for the edification of the general public. At least six open air lunchtime concerts have been held in Port of Spain and in 2018 we intend to increase that and include venues in South so that everyone in the country can benefit from these performances. At least 15 shows, productions within our performance spaces have been held over the year and we intend to increase that, Madam Speaker. And I want to let you know, Madam Speaker, that what we have been working on successfully, and I want to thank the staff, is ensuring that these productions are not overpriced in terms of how much they cost to produce. And so therefore, we can have more productions for less money, Madam Speaker. And that is what we are looking for. Value for money, more for less. Madam Speaker, we have run the program called Music Schools in the Community in 2017. 250 persons and 90% of them under the age of 20. Five venues around this country have benefited from learning to play the steel pan and another instrument and the introduction to reading music, music literacy, because we know the importance and effect that can have on young children. Madam Speaker, they were exposed to three months of training and some of that training took place in the panyards as we want to maximize the potential of the panyard as a learning space in the communities. And Madam Speaker, in 2018, we intend to take some of the students who show the most promise in this program and allow them to attend a music school of their choice within the community, the neighborhood person who teaches violin at the neighborhood music school. We intend to afford them that opportunity, of course, with the requisite monitoring and evaluation to be able to further their musical careers as we generate the new cadre of musicians in Trinidad and Tobago. Cultural camps, Madam Speaker, 19 camps held over the vacation time to give our children healthy, positive options for engagement. Over 500 students participated in the vacation classes where they learned elements of the culture, elements of the arts, and that was held all around the country, and we intend to continue that. Madam Speaker, I also want to mention that the Diplomatic Corps has worked very closely with the Ministry to ensure that we had cultural exchanges taking place in this country. So you can sit in Trinidad and Tobago at one of our well-maintained performance spaces, Madam Speaker, and enjoy the culture of China, of India, of Venezuela, of Mongolia, and that all of those happened over this 2017, and we have pledged our support to the diplomatic community to continue to expose the people of Trinidad and Tobago to those experiences in this country. And Madam Speaker, along with having all of these programs, what we have done as we seek to grow audiences and to immerse our citizenry in culture and the arts, what we have done is increase our marketing of events, Madam Speaker, using the most cost-effective means possible, and we have also launched the Culture TT app. And I encourage everyone listening to go download our app because that is where we are going to put all of our cultural activities happening in the country so that you can have a repository for the cultural events of Trinidad and Tobago. And for 2018, Madam Speaker, we intend to publish an annual cultural calendar listing all of the events that are being held by the ministry and other um, persons in the country that deal with all of our facets of culture so that everyone can plan to attend different events and really immerse themselves in the culture of Trinidad and Tobago. Allow me very quickly, Madam Speaker, to speak about personal development and the work of the mediation department, where over 7,000 persons, some of them referred by the courts, took, play, took part in the mediation, and of course that has the effect of reducing the, the caseload in the courts, Madam Speaker. Also, over 2,000 persons participated in the workshops offered by this department, and those workshops are in conflict management, parental support, and they're also in the schools running the peer mediation program, Madam Speaker. And we have, I would have stood here again in 2016 and told the Parliament that the mediation department was making um, a down payment for two buses that that would happen in 2017, so those retrofitted buses that are all soundproof and so on can serve as mediation centers for the rural areas that don't have the benefit of a mediation office very close. And Madam Speaker, I'm happy to report that as promised, that down payment has been made. And in 2018, the Ministry 
um, looks forward to taking possession of those two buses and the service of the rural communities in terms of mediation. Madam Speaker, it is well known that we, as the Ministry of Community Development, Culture and the Arts, support community initiatives through our grant funding program, and we continue to do so in 2017, and we will continue to do so in 2018. Madam Speaker, however, the policy that we introduced in 2016, we are now looking at how it has been enacted, how it has been implemented, and we will be making certain adjustments to ensure, Madam Speaker, that our present circumstances are realized, and we also will be working with groups to present to us realistic budgets. Because, Madam Speaker, unfortunately, many of the NGOs and the community groups that apply to us need some help in that area. And we are well poised to offer that assistance going forward in 2018. With respect to heritage preservation, Madam Speaker, we at the Ministry of Community Development and the Arts are in charge of the National Museum and Art Gallery. And uh, that museum, as you well know, is in need of an upgrade. That museum that has a building that's 100 years old, more than 100 years old. And so we will be going forward, Madam Speaker, um, trying to get the design for what we need to do to upgrade the museum, the museum, sorry, bearing in mind our present circumstances. And we intend to have that way forward um, outlined in 2018. With respect to the Sugar Museum, Madam Speaker, that was very briefly opened before the elections in 2015 and closed its doors soon after that, we are um, intending to open that museum in 2018 and therefore we are now working out the plan for utilization of it and also the scope of works which have already been prepared for um, refurbishing the building which does need some work in order to be reopened. Let me mention also the refurbishment works that have already been contracted and awarded Madam Speaker and will be taking place on the Museum of the City of Port of Spain and we intend to open that museum with a carnival theme Madam Speaker with some performance space um, incorporated into it and we intend to have the doors of that museum that really um, is in an area where there's so much foot traffic in the heart of the city where anybody, the tourists coming from the nearby port, um, anybody walking through the city can get a snapshot of Trinidad Carnival and Trinidad culture. So it is a museum and we intend to put it to use to ensure that there's always a presence of our largest festival, Carnival, in the city of Port of Spain. Madam Speaker, our, the last area I'd like to mention is the support and development of cultural tourism products. Madam Speaker, it is well known that Trinidad and Tobago has festivals almost every month. And the Ministry of Community Development, Culture and the Arts, one is the one that um, underpins some of these festivals by hosting these festivals, and in other ways, we support the festivals that other people and other NGOs have. So Madam Speaker, if I were to mention a few of them, I could mention the community festivals that take place around the country in the month of June, and these are hosted by the ministry and staff of the ministry. The Bocas List the Fest, Madam Speaker, in April, Trinidad and Tobago Film Festival in September, the Opera Festival in July, the Trinidad and Tobago Music Festival in March, <coughs> Carnival, our largest festival between January and February, Diwali in October, Ramlila in October, the Best Village Folk Theatre Festival in September, Eid, which varies from, from month to month depending on the year, Jose in September, Patriotism Month, another initiative of the Ministry of Community Development, Culture and the Arts between August and September, Emancipation between July and August, Parang Festivals October to December, Sand Fest in October, Pagua between February and March, and Madam Speaker, that is not an exhaustive list. One of the largest growing areas in tourism, as I'm sure the Minister of Tourism will elaborate on, is festival and cultural tourism. And we see our role as the developers of these festivals, the supporters of these festivals. And of course, very important, the link is being made between the Ministry of Culture, who are responsible for culture, and the Ministry of Tourism, and the new entity, Tourism Trinidad, to be able to develop and to market these, these festivals abroad. Because that is one of the greatest draws to Trinidad and Tobago. And so we will continue to develop these festivals. Madam Speaker, allow me to mention that Trinidad and Tobago will host Kai Festa 2019. Madam Speaker, we know that this is an opportunity for our artisans, 
for our cultural tourism product, for entrepreneurs, this is a large opportunity for this country and therefore we are treating it with the requisite respect that it deserves. And so, though we are in 2017, Madam Speaker, the implementation plan for CAIFESTA is already being drafted and will be finalized before the end of calendar 2017. We are serious about this business, Madam Speaker. The management committee the CARIFESTA Secretariat, all of that, things are put in place to be able to have those in place so that in 2018, Madam Speaker, it meets us implementing the CARIFESTA plan so that by 2019, all is in place for a successful CARIFESTA because that, Madam Speaker, has the potential to drive our tourism industry as we are putting ourselves and putting ourselves in place that has potential to kick it off and we really want to ensure and we will ensure that in collaboration with all of the ministries because it's an inter-ministerial team right now drafting that plan all the ministries will be on board and contributing in every way necessary to put Trinidad and Tobago not only on the regional map but on the international map through CARIFESTA 2019. Madam Speaker all of this work could not have been possible without the hard work and dedication of the executives and the staff of the Ministry of Community Development, Culture and the Arts, working hard with professionalism, very strong work ethic, and what I appreciated most, Madam Speaker, they took the guidance for the cost-cutting measures with grace and they executed without sacrificing quality to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And for their hard work in achieving more with less, I want to really thank them for their efforts. Madam Speaker, I stand here by virtue of having been elected by the people of St. Anne's East constituency and therefore let me turn to my constituency and speak a bit about what's happening there. Let me first thank my office staff, staff of the St. Anne's East constituency office who have given yeoman service to our constituents over the last two years and counting. Madam Speaker, they have gone beyond the call of duty many times to ensure that the constituents receive the respect that they should, regardless of, of, of what happens when they come into the office. They have gone beyond the call of duty, and I thank them for treating them with that level of respect and love and service. I also want to thank Corporate St. Anzis for supporting. They have been very supportive in all the initiatives, and I thank them for that. Madam Speaker, 2017 has been a year, I'm going to call it a watershed year, as I mentioned, water. And the MP for Oropooch West, she did mention the amount of landslides and floods we experienced in St. Anzis through Santa Cruz, the North Coast Road, Maracas Bay, Las Cuevas, up to which my constituency reaches, Madam Speaker. We have been challenged in 2017. And I want to publicly thank the responders, Madam Speaker, who came out last two weeks or so, there was a flood on a Thursday evening and people's homes were affected. And I saw staff of the regional corporation, URP, CPEP, in people's homes, sweeping out water, lifting out mud. And I want to thank them for their response and for helping the people of St. Anne's East. I also want to recognize the Minister of Works and his staff who were on spot every single time when the big stone fell in the road, when the, the river overflowed its banks, they were there on spot assisting us to ensure that the people of St. Anne's East got the service they deserved. Madam Speaker, I want to assure my constituents that there are some pressing issues that they have been contacting me about. I know that we want to upgrade the saddle road I know that there are some issues with water and so on, but I want to thank my constituents for their patience and for their understanding. And I want to ensure, I want to assure them that my cabinet colleagues have been very responsive, have been helping in every way they can to alleviate any little difficulties that we have had. And so we look forward to their continued support in 2018. I want to thank some of my colleagues and their staff members because we have had some notable upgrades in our constituency. I want to thank the Ministry of Agriculture and the Minister for the upgrades in the Squavers Fishing Depot, Madam Speaker. And, and, and when I mention this, I want to say that the people of St. Anne's East languished between 2010 and 2015. And so I am so happy 
that they are able to have some measure of attention paid to them at this point in time. So thank you, Ministry of Agriculture, for the upgrade to the Scravers Fishing Depot. Thank you for the Namdevco Farmers Market in Bukmalatra that is serving the constituents of Lower Santa Cruz. I want to thank the Ministry of Works for rescuing that Maracas Bay project from the overspend that we would have been facing, Madam Speaker. I want to thank them, and I want to thank them for the work that I saw proceeding apace when I passed there last week. I want to thank them as well for the roundabout at the corner of Saddle Road and La Pastora that we have been asking for for years because it causes a lot of dangerous accidents happening at that point, and that roundabout has been very helpful in alleviating that damage, so I want to thank them for that. I want to thank the Ministry of Natural Security for opening the Maraca St. Joseph Police Station. And let me say, Minister, that the residents are very, very grateful. They now feel a sense of security and safety in that community because crime was rearing its ugly head. But opening that center and that community station, sorry, made a difference to them because they knew that the government was truly caring and willing to do something about their security. Madam Speaker, the member for Coover North, I know that she's not here right now, but she did ask, um, she did say that she didn't know there were any new police youth clubs being opened around the country and she was not sure. But I want to let her know that in St. Anne's East, we are very, very grateful for the establishment of the Bogmalatris Police Youth Club as well as the Maracas um, St. Joseph Police Youth Club, which have now joined all the others, the Maracas Bay Police Youth Club, the Febo Village Police Youth Club, the Lacano and so on. So we are glad for the establishment of two new police youth clubs because they bring with them a lot of positive involvement for our young people. And in St. Anne's East, we need that. And so we thank you, Ministry of National Security. <laughs> Madam Speaker. I will, it would be remiss of me not to mention, and I'm thanking Unicot and the project unit of the Ministry of Community Development, Culture and the Arts for noticing that we have very old centers in need of upgrading St. Anne's East and for some work that is happening there. So I want to thank Unicot and the project unit for that work on one or two of our centers. Madam Speaker, I want to thank the Regional Corporation, Pure, Ministry of Works, Ministry of Rural Development for assistance in Farrell Hill, Susulans, Charlo Lane, and that road paving assistance that is so necessary. We thank you for it, and we thank you for what is to come in 2018. And Ministry of Education, we thank you for upgrading the La Pastora Government School. It really was necessary, unification. We thank you for what we received there. Madam Speaker, I want to indicate that to my constituents that I continue to stay and stand at this honorable house in advocacy. Your original 45 minutes are now spent. You're entitled to 10 more minutes if you wish. You may proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to assure my constituents that their member of parliament is here, is present, and is always advocating for the increase in their quality of life. I want to assure them as well that this government and every minister here is committed to ensuring that whatever we can do to assist them will be done. I want to also assure the national community, Madam Speaker, that the Ministry of Community Development, Culture and the Arts is tending to your needs and is ensuring that we reach out in all of these areas and these will always redound to the benefit of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, with these few words, I thank you. Member for Komuto, Mansinella. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for this opportunity, and I rise to contribute to this budget debate, and I take the opportunity to applaud and endorse the sterling contributions of the opposition leader and honorable member of Separia and my other colleagues. In the, in, I would like to start off by quoting the honorable opposition leader in her initial reaction to the fiscal package, and honorable men, um, leader indicated it's a bankrupt budget that will cause everything, every single thing in this country to go up and the people will suffer. It is bankrupt of any ideas, it is bankrupt of any plan to take the country out of the recession that we are in, and it is one that is literally bankrupt in the country. So in every regard, it's a bankrupt budget. Amen. You know, and um, what pains me this, today is to, to hear how the, the members on the government side are struggling 
to defend this budget. They're literally struggling. But before I go on to anything, I just want to respond to a um, member for St. Anne's East brought a very valid point that um, the Napa and Sapa did not have a um, maintenance plan. I, I wonder if member remembers that um, this Napa and Sapa was in fact opened hurriedly for Chogam and it was under the PNM administration. And if, and, and if, and if a member would remember, it was now Prime Minister who had a, a, a very public argument with the then Prime Minister, Honorable Patrick Manning, regarding the same very Napa and Sapa. And when we came into government, when we came into government, we had to um, look at the building and there was serious structural info. Folks on the order 53, we, we're trying to hear the speaker, but, but we're getting a lot of muttering from that side. Okay, so, so we can't uh, members, I know it's coming towards the suspension, but please contain yourself so that we can all hear the contribution for Commuter Manson. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And so as such, um, and there were serious overruns, started at 100 million US dollars for each, and it went on to 200 million US dollars for each. And counting. and counting. And at the end of it, there were serious structural defects, so much so that we had to um, intervene and shut it down. So, the, and, and, and of course, all of these um, issues took place under the PNM. So if there wasn't any maintenance plan, it, it is not the fault of the People's Partnership. And so continuing, um, question I would like to ask is, Carrie Fester, at what cost and in the implementation, is there any consideration to the security that would be required? Because you're looking at persons that are coming in for tourism, but we have a serious problem with crime here. And internationally, internationally, we are being um, branded, branded by uh, countries such as, the, as Britain and the US and, and Australia that persons should be wary about um, considering coming to Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm just saying, I'm not saying that you already have your plans, but is there a plan for security, which you don't need to answer at this, at this point. And um, continuing, just to put in a plug, um, this will not cost you one cent, um, Honorable Minister, but the people of Plumetan would like to know when you will get their community center open, as it has already been completed one year ago. So, continuing, um, I was listening to the member for Dabadi O'Meara, and I really felt for you very much. But you know, you were very open and very honest, and you said your constituents feared the budget, yeah. Madam Speaker, and that is what we have been trying to say. Everyone fears this budget. Yeah. And therefore, and therefore, um, I, I, I thought it was very honest. Because no one on the, other, uh, on, the, on the government is actually saying that is the one that is fair in uh, any of their constituents. But I guess a um, member would have enough time to spend in his constituency as um, he doesn't have a, a ministry. But it's, it's the same point that we are trying to explain, that people are fearful as to how they will survive. What will they do? How will they cope? And so, and so you know, when we understand that the added burdens of overall increases, which averages about around 10%, will place additional burdens, especially on female-headed households. And this 10% overall rise in the cost of living devalues savings, raises costs, and increases hardship. And so this is what we are looking at, the given continued economic pressure brought to bear on households and the associated social impact of increased prices, job losses, and wage freezes. Of course, with that, a greater demand is expected for social services, uh, obviously, and allocations in the budget does not indicate a responsible response to this reality. And this is where our concern is. And it's a concern that is being articulated not only to the opposition um, members, but also to the government from what is being articulated here today. So, in continuing, we are looking at what, what is, is in fact needed, what is in fact required. And I listened to the, um, to the member for, for Lopino Bonia. And the member indicated, 
several things. First of all, that 170,000 recipients hope for a better future based on this budget. And I, I strongly disagree because 170,000 persons do not hope for a better future. As a matter of fact, we had persons on Friday marching. We had persons in, in Detroit, Trinidad burning um, tires in protest of this budget. And therefore, the, it indicates that people do not have a hope and they are fearful and they're trying to get the attention of the government to say, hey, hold up, wait up. You know, tell us how, how is it going to work? How, what, what, what provisions are in place to take care of, of my needs while we are going through this, this, this process? Because we, see, we have been told, you know, tighten your belt. A um, member from um, Gabby O'Mara says, you know, he drank um, and back in his days, you know, the, the gallon of, of, of pear drugs and whatever it is, and you know, they had to, to, to drink sorrel and so forth, and, and all that is understandable. But what are we saying to the people today? Because we're not buying pear drugs, we're not buying um, side drugs, we're in fact just trying to, to survive with whatever little that we have in buying um, groceries that have gone up because of, yeah. of, um, of increased prices. And what causes these prices to, to increase? First of all, well, before I get there, you know, something that um, I, I listened to a um, member for Lopino Bonia, and I was a little bit, I was a little bit taken aback because I, I heard for 55 minutes, I heard from the member all sorts of things. I heard about reports, plans, conferences, programs, but nothing about the, 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 the needs of the persons that the, the ministry is there to serve. I didn't hear anything about that. I didn't hear any concern. I didn't hear anything being articulated as to what were the plans that would be in place. And you know, I, I listened to, to, to the, the point of the disability grant. And in the disability grant, the, these words were, were said. said uh, member said, divergent views were coming from various sectors concerning the disability um, way forward. And, and so therefore, that whole plan is still in limbo. And, and my question is, you know, why not look at best practice internationally? Why reinvent the wheel? And therefore, you know, um, people, people would have different opinions and so forth, but at the end of the day, um, we can't have a whole, a whole um, um, stakeholder group being um, put on the back burner because of the fact that you, you can't find a, a, a common way forward. And therefore, there's a... It's, it's a very, it's a, it's, a, it's a serious situation. I mean, Madam Speaker, I broke my foot recently and I had to learn to walk on a crutches. I had to learn. I didn't know, it. I thought it was easy. I see everybody doing it. I just hop on, you know, and I go on my way, not realizing it is not easy. And in fact, I injured my good foot and, and, and my, my shoulder. And as a result, I had to go into a wheelchair. And you know, because of the fact that I'm in the, I went through that situation, I'm under, I understand even more how difficult it is for someone who has a disability to cope, particularly if they, they have been thrown into it, you know, suddenly, whether it's by accident, um, a vehicle accident, and they, 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 they have to live that way, or, or they were born. It doesn't matter. The point about it is that we have to be a little bit more sensitive as to how we move forward with um, disbursing disability grants, and therefore, there must be a formula that we can, we can glean from internationally, best practice, and, and tailor it to suit what um, yeah. our needs. And so my concern was also um, a registry, a registry to, find, to, to put in place for, for our um, disability um, recipients, still outstanding three years later. When, when um, we were in government um, under the astute leadership of Kamala Prasad Bisesa, we had um, teamed up with ODPM because ODPM already has a, a, a list in place because when they go and they work with the regional corporations, particularly in areas where there is um, uh, natural disasters, they already have a list in. So it's a matter of just teaming up with ODPM and um, working with the registry as opposed to waiting for any lengthy period of time because at the end of the day, if something, um, a tragic incident were to happen to Trinidad and Tobago, the first person that you need to respond to are those who are bedridden, those who are incapacitated. And if we don't have that information now, 
I mean, I mean, thank God, thank God, we have not had a, a, a Maria or a, 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 a Irma or anything like that. Because had it been so, I mean, the first persons who probably would have, who would have probably lost, um, uh, probably their lives, would be um, those who are in that position. And then, of course, we have the um, members spoke about the socially displaced, and uh, and uh, member said she met with four ministers and Doma and chairman to determine what was already public knowledge. Um, Madam Speaker, from inception, when we came in, uh, one of the first things that we wanted to deal with would have been the, the um, socially displaced and how to, how to work around having them um, rehabilitated. And what we recognize is that uh, the human rights um, aspect of it prohibits us from physically removing anyone off of the streets. Um, they have to go voluntarily. And I found it strange after, after having all these meetings and all these discussions and so forth, you were able to determine this was the reason that you can't move them over the street. And it's like, really? But that would have been in the ministry already. That would have been already articulated and already in a, in a document stating that we probably need to bring legislation to parliament to find a way how to remove persons, you know, not voluntarily because of the fact that it, it, it's causing a problem um, on the streets. I mean, some, some persons are um, um, mentally um, unstable, and as a result, they are causing a lot of injury to um, innocent um, pedestrians and even persons who are driving by when they get violent and they throw stuff and, and so forth. So therefore, you know, I want to suggest to, to, um, to the member, there is a document there that was um, approved by the, by the government of the day, that is um, the PP, that we visited a um, chapter. Honorable Member for Kamuto. Members, it is agreed that we will take the suspension at 5 o'clock. We'll resume at 5.30.